Hi. Hello. I'm waiting oh, for Mac. The, the NSA or somebody tell me this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> I heard it. You guys aren't going to believe what's going on, but hold on. Um, okay, I'm waiting for Mick to come in. So I have a suggestion, take it for what it's worth. You're being but, recorded, so keep that in mind. Uh, actually, that's the point, yeah. So, <laughs> so you uploaded the recording, and then like I had to tell people, well, if you really want to go to where this presentation starts, go to the 11-minute mark. So maybe you might want to think in the future about actually starting the recording then. Because it's weird if someone doesn't care about all this talking and whatever, and they, what is this? And they might not watch the presentation. Oh, well, you're talking about the anyway. sting we did last night? No, no, no. I'm talking about my presentation so on the belief in science. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the same thing will happen here since you started recording, and he might not really start talking for 15 minutes. And it's kind of weird if someone just wants to watch the presentation. Oh, it, okay. Well, we so, could always cut it back if we wanted to. Yeah, I don't know. Can you edit it yeah, before you upload it? You can? No. Okay. Yeah, of course I can do it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, didn't do it. Yeah, I didn't okay, know if, so. how Zoom worked, if it was a whole or nothing thing. <laughs> what character is that? Yeah, okay, so this is it. I All right, you guys, character. sorry. Yes, it does say Joanne. So sorry. It'll make sense in a minute. Oh, that was your sting name. Hello. Yes, you guys, you, you're, not gonna Hi, you're not going to believe all that happened. So, Hello. yeah, Jeanette Wilson's at it again, huh? Yeah, this was. Yeah, that's her sting name. She'll explain in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Actually, that's right. She did call you by name once, Joanne. No, people aren't dying from COVID. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. They don't know what you're talking about, Rob. Hold on, hold on. I know. And it's it I is know. perfect because it fits right with uh, it fits right with Mick's talk today. Oh, cool. Because it's conspiracy related. <laughs> oh, my God. But she did a 180 degree turn in like 10 minutes. It was like, no one's dying. It's not happening to, oh, yeah, it's real, but it's going to go away in a year. Like, what? Did I miss something? Like, how did she make that U-turn so quickly? Okay, so can somebody post that my name says Joanne Nilsson and I don't have time to change it right now? <laughs> so, that, so people don't freak out whenever they see that it's not Susan Gerbeck or about time or whatever it normally should say. <laughs> yeah, because oh, <laughs> Mick's like, is this right? Something random. doesn't look right. <laughs> yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna text you, Susan, that John Nelson was taking a sweet time letting me in. <laughs> <laughs> that, evil, that evil woman. <laughs> evil woman. Okay, hold on. So yeah, show this around so we can hey, get- Hey, Carl. Hi. Carl's here, that is really cool. So, all right. Looks like, looks like a vast man cave there. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, wow. Check it out. Where's oh, all the cats? Wow. And over there I have. Oh, it's not a television. background. It's a real thing. <laughs> I thought it was television. a you fake the background. the main television and the second television. Oh, that's wonderful. Paula, what is that picture of? That is a well-known meme. I can't believe you haven't seen it before. I'm sorry, but I've been busy. Doing Normally, it's like a, this guy's in his, this little dog's in this burning room, and it's like, this is fine, and he drinks his coffee, and it's just a, you know, a reflection on life as it is today. This is okay. This is normal now. That looks like me. Here comes Lee Pinter. Hello. Hi, Lee. Hello. Okay, so I had to, I had to go grab him. A copy of Escaping the Rabbit Hole. Is it look like it's mirroring to you guys okay? Yeah. You can read it. Yeah. Okay. Fine. On my end, it looks backwards. Yeah, so I'm allowing people to get into this room. So I'm going to keep one eye on here too. And we're, we're about ready to start. Mick, are you okay? Sure, yeah. Can I get you anything? <laughs> <laughs> Small glass of wine. <laughs> there you go. Like water. Uh, here comes somebody. Raise iPad. I don't know if Susan is loud or you're low, but your volumes are very different, Mick and, and Hi, Joanne. Ray. Yeah, Mick is a soft-spoken kind of man. Let me see. Is that and, any better? Yeah. Susan is not. Better. Okay. Say again? Susan is not soft-spoken. No. Hey, Mick. So try to be loud. I shall speak. 
Her okay. name's Jeff. At Susan Levels. Oh, there's some really these people I haven't seen in so long. I'm I like these calls just so I can at least talk to people that I haven't seen in a while. Jeff. Jeff's coming on. Um, okay, so I'm not playing and muting everybody this time. Well, I don't know. I might whenever whenever I might start off by muting everybody. And then um, just because everybody's going to get themselves settled and then um, opening it up to questions and then I'll unmute you guys and you can ask your questions yourself. So this is being recorded if anybody isn't paying attention. So if you do not want to be seen on the internet on our channel, then you better put up do what Paul is doing and put up a fake picture or something. <laughs> it's already too late because I'm already recording. All right. So welcome. Thank you guys for showing up and for all of those people who are watching us on YouTube right now. I am so thankful that you guys are here. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm, this is going to be a, a great discussion that we're going to have with a very good friend of mine, uh, Mick West, who is from Manchester, England with that great accent. So what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to, uh, instead of having Mick do a lecture, and I can point you to a couple different lectures that Mick has done for the Monterey County Skeptics, and I will put those in the, in the comment section so you guys can listen to a couple of his talks as, long, uh, as well as his really creative uh, websites where he has a lot of uh, power, where he um, does these great videos and has a huge following of people who love to watch his stuff and love to see um, what does Mick think of this this new UFO thing coming out or this chemtrail whatever. So um, let me give you a little bit more background. Mick is a um, I guess he's now sort of retired from the business world. Of, uh, like now he's in the um, the world of skepticism, a professional skeptic of sorts, and his uh, he came from the. The Johnny Hack, what is this guy's name? The guy who skateboards. Oh gosh, all of a sudden just left me here. I'm gonna unmute you, Mick. Tony uh, Hawk. Yeah. Tony Hawk. Ton Tony Hawk from uh, the skateboarding um, games. So, yeah, Tony Hawk's pro skater. Yeah, there you go. So everybody's gonna know you from that, and you can, if you want to talk about your background a little bit more, that's fine. But um, I met Mick, oh gee, I think it's one of the amazing meetings, the James Randi Educational Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of these people who was, you know, just part of the group and it was great having him around. But we got to know Mick a lot more whenever he went to, um, he lives up in the Sacramento area, which is about three hours from where I am. And so we both went to one of the conferences in uh, Berkeley or Oakland, uh, for the Bay Area skeptics. And um, I always show up there early and we usually try to get a gang of people together and we play games or whatever we can do after we have like a skeptics in the pub and Mick showed up and we played, um, this is before Cards Against Humanity. So we played uh, Apples to Apples and I have some really good photos of you playing Apples to Apples really? and we're hanging out with a group and I thought, oh, this guy's really interesting. I didn't, to be honest with you, I did not know that you were who you are who you the the expertise you had i i, well, I was like a psychic uh... <laughs> that was just a different world for me so i got to know mick over the years and he has giving a lecture um to the monterey county skeptics um 2019 i believe is when you came down and you gave a talk to us um he's an expert on conspiracy theories especially the um kim trells uh contrails uh ufos 9-11 and so on that's probably more or less his expertise those technical things and i asked mick if he would give us a talk on on you know something a little different and at the time california was on fire we had fires everywhere it was really awful it's 2019 so mick says i'm going to do a, cons uh, a talk on conspiracy theories of wildfires and i thought wait, there's conspiracy theories of wildfires? You gotta be kidding me. So he did a talk, I learned a ton. He's a really good, he's really good at explaining things. He's very calm and, and, and shows you examples, not just talking. He's not just talking at you, he's talking with you. And so he brings the people in the audience along with him in, in telling the story. So you can kind of see, and when I show you, when you look at this video, when you follow the link, you will see how, 
to a person who's got a conspiracy mind uh, belief that they're following, they look at it and they say, yeah, why is that log hollow? Why, why are trash cans and trash all over this place when everything else is on fire? And then Mick will bring you along with examples of why that the science behind it, why that happened instead of just, um, he doesn't have, he's very kind to people and, and helps them bring them along. And, and I think that's, that's a wonderful, uh, uh, something that we need to have as skeptics when we're talking to people we need to have more of a sympathy and an empathy towards the people because a lot of us are conspiracy theorists and we could probably have fallen into that rabbit hole so i'm going to mention this book so i got one of the early copies um i believe because you asked me to read it <laughs> for um for a review and this is escaping the rabbit hole i highly recommend it this uh book is talks a lot about um he's interviewed people who have been in the rabbit hole and who have gotten themselves out of the rabbit hole um and the tricks and and how they manage to do that and, I, and we'll talk about that today um, mick also has a podcast it's called um tells from the rabbit hole is that right and i haven't missed an episode some of them are a little over my head because they get a little technical about the 9-11 building seven falling but that's fine because um these podcasts isn't necessarily for somebody like me. It's for those people who are very into it. And some people are very into it. the discussions he has about UFOs and planes. And th there's a lot of interest in this area. So um, Mick has a podcast. I think it's on his second year. We've done maybe 30 episodes, something like that. 44, I think. Really that many. 43 something like that so mick do you want to give us a, a um you guys make sure you can you can ask questions in the chat if you want as we go along and or at the end what i'm going to do is unmute you guys and you can ask your questions to Mick it yourselves and um this will be fun so it's going to be a conversation with mick and i throughout this so that'll be fun so mick yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself that uh, maybe i've skipped well, or mispronounced I, or whatever <laughs> i think you covered quite a lot there i there was some stuff there that even I had forgotten. There were so many, <laughs> so many things in there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a very good overview of what I do. Uh, like I, I was the was one of the people who founded NeverSoft, which uh, was the company that did the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater games, and that kind of allowed me to have a bit of freedom in terms of uh, you know doing what I wanted to do after I left the industry, like uh, like over ten years ago now. And so I've done a lot of uh, just following my own interests and my interests are, are quite varied, but they're kind of you know, congealed, uh, for want of a better word, around conspiracy theories uh, and especially the scientific claims uh, that go into conspiracy theories. And uh, it started out with the chemtrail thing. And I, I that was, it was basically, I was learning to fly because I always had this dream when I was a kid that uh, a, uh, when I got enough money, I would buy a plane and learn to fly and, uh, uh, become like you know just going around the country flying but so I, I did learn to fly but it, it wasn't quite as much fun as I thought it would be because uh, uh, you know the small planes are very uncomfortable and it's basically you're paying a lot of money just to uh, go to somewhere and have lunch and then come back again <laughs> so I, I uh, but whilst I was learning to fly I learned about aviation weather and things like that you know just stuff that you need to learn about when you're learning to fly. And then I, I came across this conspiracy theory about the chemtrails, uh, which is like saying that the lines that planes leave behind them uh, are um, some kind of toxic spraying by the government. And so I started writing a blog about that. And uh, uh, that was like a long time ago now, probably like 12, 13 years ago, uh, back in 2006, I think I did that. And it's still going strong. I haven't managed to debunk it for everybody, but what I've done is kind of create a bunch of resources for people. And this, this is one of my approaches uh, when it comes to debunking. And instead of just having arguments with people and discussions with people, try to create something that's reusable. And I think there's a lot of effort that goes in, in the skeptic community and just in science. Uh, in just kind of, briefly addressing things almost like to one person you have an argument say on a on facebook or you have an argument on uh, <clears throat> on a bulletin board and what happens is that uh, might be a very good argument and you might make some very good points and you might write, write this really long post but then it kind of just gets lost 
it's lost to history. There's, there's probably loads of wonderful articles on places like uh, the old JREF forum, mm -hmm. uh, which is now the, the International Skeptics uh, Foundation, uh, where people did these very detailed posts and they did these wonderful explanations and they explained things to people, but now, you know, there's no way of finding that. Mm -hmm. So something I've been trying to do over the years is get things into a format that can be reused. And uh, part of that was, was, you know, the book, because that's kind of a distillation of some of the stuff that I did. Uh, there's chapters on chemtrails and chapters on 9-11 and chapters on, uh, on flat earth even. Uh, but because it's in a, a format that's accessible and a nice, nice chunk and it's all focused, it's useful. And I just think that's something that people need to, need to do more of is actually uh, try to make, when you do a debunk or you do an explanation or you, you do an investigation, make it be accessible uh, to other people. Is, now, is that out on an audiobook? Uh, it is out on audiobook. And I was quite That's surprised at how many, yeah, lots of people listen to it on audio. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, it's a bit of a visual uh, thing because there's, 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 there's a number of uh, diagrams in it, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you don't get to see. Like there's, uh, you know, there's various, various graphs and things. And the, there's one in particular, which is this uh, conspiracy spectrum uh, thing that I have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and you kind of really have to see it. You have to see the diagram. But a lot of people they they they, they read the audio book or they listen to the audio book and they, they don't see any of the diagrams. But they seem to seem to quite like it, which was kind of surprising to me. They also had a British guy do the uh, the narration of the audio book. Oh, which, uh, <laughs> you should have done it. Uh, I'm not I'm not very good at uh, reading things. But I suppose I've got better that that because you know I wrote the book uh, like it was about two years ago now, and that was before I started my podcast. And so I think my, my general speaking voice has improved over the years. So I probably, probably could do a better job now. But this guy was an actual actor, you know, a guy who'd done like various bit parts as uh, the British villain in, uh, mm -hmm. in various movies. And so he, he had a, a much more kind of Cambridge accent. Yes, came, came trail people, they think that the lines behind the clouds, or the lines of clouds behind planes are actually some kind of forum <laughs> spreading. So they, <laughs> instead of my half Yorkshire, half London, half, uh, <laughs> half American accent. <laughs> How long have you been over in the American states now? I have been in the, the American colonies. states uh, <laughs> for, let's see, I think over 25 years now. I've been married for over 20 years. Have I been married over 20 years? I don't know. My wife will correct me, but <laughs> <laughs> it feels like 20 years. <laughs> she might correct you very loudly. Um, you better be careful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she can't hear me right now. She's at the other end of the house. But yeah, I've, I've been here over 20 years and uh, uh, I still have my accent in part because of the company that uh, I, I kind of co-founded had a lot of British people in it. Uh, so uh, we, were all, we would all just talk to each other in British English. So we didn't, we didn't get our, our accents corrupted. Um, by the the American uh, way of speaking, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, twenty years. I'm an American citizen, married to American. Oh well, there you go. So um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the podcast, and so the book, as I, as you know, I find very compelling, and not the data, not the the science behind the these the. the not the science behind the conspiracy theories, but what really mm -hmm. compels me is the stories, these personal stories by people that you interviewed. And um, I assume that people came to you uh, because of Metabunk, um, because the, you, became, you had a name. So um, people would come to you either to argue. It sounds like on your podcast, some people come to you and they want to argue with you about yeah. conspiracy theories and realize, well, you're kind of a nice guy and maybe start looking into some of your videos and some of the work you're doing. And eventually they kind of come along and get out of this rabbit hole. Can you talk really briefly about how it is that people use using this metaphor again of falling into a rabbit hole, how it usually happens. And then, and then we'll talk about how, people get out or find, you know, how they manage to get out, but talk briefly about how they tend to get into it. Yeah. People get into the rabbit hole, like a conspiracy theory rabbit hole or whatever type of you know, rabbit hole, like some kind of pseudoscience or whatever for a combination of kind of basically two things. Like one thing is kind of being at a place in their life where they are somewhat vulnerable to that. Uh, like either they've got a lot of spare time. This is a very common thing. People have a lot of spare time. 
uh, or perhaps they're, you know, they're going through some kind of trauma or they're just having a difficult time in their, their life in some other way. Uh, and then they get sucked into it by finding some kind of vein of knowledge that they can follow. And the most common vein of knowledge is YouTube. And this was much more of a problem uh, in the past than it is now, but YouTube had these algorithms which would, uh, if you watch one video uh, that was a conspiracy type video, then they would show you another video. And a lot of these videos are very slickly produced. You think of like, you, a lot of you have probably seen the, the Plandemic video. It's got fairly high production values. It doesn't take that much to actually do things like that. You just need some sort of good lighting and a good recorder and you know, a good camera and a couple of people to ask questions. But you can make a very compelling video. So the way people get sucked in now is really uh, by watching something on YouTube. Like if it's 9-11, uh, they, will, they will see like loose change typically. Famous uh, back in the day uh, video about the 9-11 conspiracy theory. And so that's how they get sucked in. Well, now I remember back in the day, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, when we had VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. And um, when the internet first kind of started a thing, people would say, um, you know, it was this, if it's on the internet, it must be real. I guess the same thing was if it was on TV, it must be, you know, there must be something to it. But I remember people f passing off VHS tapes or cassette tapes as if it was secret knowledge. Like here, I want to I'm going to loan you this, make sure you look it over and rewind, don't forget to rewind it and get it back to me. But it's really important that you watch this. So now YouTube yeah. is obviously much more nefarious because as you said, the algorithms that are affected where, you know, you watch one video, then you're going to watch the next video because you're going to be suggested the next video. Whereas back in the day when I was young and learning about conspiracy theories, you had a VHS tape, but it was kind of, you know, and you didn't have his way of discussing with your, these people across the world as easily as you do now. But do you remember those days? And Yeah, well, I, I, I must admit, I don't remember passing VHS tapes around. But <laughs> you know, what you describe is, uh, in, in some respects, it's related to what's happening now because it's uh, possessing a secret. If you have this secret VHS tape, it's always a more, lot more kind of cloak and dagger than uh, you know, sharing a link to a YouTube video. But it's the same type of thing, the same type of feeling that it elicits is that the person watching this tape feels like they are now privy to some kind of uh, secret understanding of the world, or at least an understanding of the world that is not shared uh, by, by the sheeple out there. And so it, it gives this kind of same kind of, same kind of action in their brain. In the, in the olden days, people would pass pamphlets around uh, or they would just tell you what this secret was and they would have some guy who would come to the town and give a talk. Uh, there, there were uh, talks given in the late 1800s about, for example, the flat earth, which were essentially almost exactly the same as the YouTube videos that are being, give, being presented now. They would give the same arguments like you know, ships don't disappear over the horizon if you look at it with a telescope. Exact same wow. arguments were given in like the 1880s uh, given in the 2020s, except uh, back then it was done via some guy in a kind of a traveling show who went around towns and gave these talks, and now it's done via YouTube. Uh, but it's the same types of things. It's, it's giving you this, this access to this, this other world, this uh, special place of, of, of knowledge, you know, a rabbit hole. They, they don't realize it's a rabbit hole, but it's, uh, it, it makes them feel special. And this is actually a, a psychological thing that people have studied and there's, there's a, a psychological marker you can, you can measure in various tests called the need for uniqueness and there's a need for uniqueness scale. And people who score higher on need for uniqueness uh, tends to be more likely to be conspiracy theorists. But then, you know, well, something I always say about that is that we all like to feel unique. So it's not like it's, they are uh, unusual in their, their, their need for uniqueness. They maybe score a little bit higher on average, but it's a fundamental human uh, desire that these videos play into. And so pretty much anybody can get sipped into them because everybody likes that feeling of, of, of discovering something new that only they know. That's really interesting. I've never heard of that uh, need for uniqueness scale. And it's funny that you're saying that it's not unusual to be somebody who needs to feel <laughs> uniqueness <laughs> little cycle going over there that is this um 
Wait, you how, think how do we're they all, how we're do on, we're on Zoom out? here? Oh. Uh, well, they, they have a series, it's basically a series of, uh, it's like a series of questions, like standardized questions that they ask people. And they have various other ones as well. There's actually a conspiracy belief scale uh, where they have a, a series of questions that they ask and then they, they rank people on this uh, conspiracy belief scale. And that's how they do these correlations between the two things. And then there's other things as well, like uh, there's openness to experience or openness to new experience and uh, agreeability. These are things that psychologists uh, can, can measure. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if psychologists is the right term, but these researchers and the social sciences, they can measure these things uh, to a degree, but they're kind of very, very blunt uh, measurements. They're not really getting into the nuances of why an individual has these particular beliefs. Uh, but they do have these things where people, people who are, I think, like less agreeable and more, uh, more, uh, more interested in uh, you being, being uniqueness and feeling special. Uh, and there's, there's, other, there's other things like the attribution error, like people who tend to attribute uh, things to some kind, of, some kind of entity. Like if you think something happens, does it happen for a reason? If you're more likely to think that things happen for a reason, then you're more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And these are just kind of fundamental psychological things that, that kind of can be measured and they all factor into whether people are more susceptible to conspiracy theories or not. But of course, yeah, it doesn't mean that these people have something wrong with them. It just means they're a little bit more uh, uh, in a certain way than other people. And you know, in some people that those different markers and the, the different values of their their psychological scales may translate into something else. They may get obsessed with, I don't know, model trains or watching soap operas or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned the history of conspiracy theories because I believe these have probably been around as long as we've been communicating with each other. Um, a, a reason to feel like you know why something is to to that I have the knowledge. I remember um, reading a lot about. Uh, the Kennedy assassination. And for a very long time, well, for many days, they did not know really what had happened or who had mm -hmm. been the person who had had um, caused, you know, had shot Kennedy, uh, not Kennedy, Nixon, not Nixon, Lincoln. Oh my gosh. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> they did know that it was, it was, I mean, he did, when he jumped off of the uh, balcony in front of everybody, everybody saw who it was. So, I mean, he was a very popular actor, but there was a lot of conspiracies going on after the fact of, you know, who might have been involved if it was, you know, because it was a very confusing time. People did not know, didn't have a lot of information. Of course, we didn't have the internet or social media. Yeah. So we were relying on word of mouth and we were relying on newspapers and so on. And so conspiracy theories have been around for. Yeah, totally. The, the word conspiracy theory itself dates back to uh, reporting about the Civil War. Oh. And there were, there were various theories about uh, why, uh, why the South succeeded uh, from the Union and uh, you know, various events around the Civil War, the American Civil War. And uh, that's when the, the term conspiracy theory came into being. Uh, to describe that type of thing. It was used before that for a few other things. It didn't really like uh, lock on really until the, the 50s and the 60s, but it was certainly used back then quite specifically to refer to this one thing about, uh, about the Civil War. And you know, that uh, was in the newspapers uh, at that time. Uh, but yeah, the conspiracy theories have been around for a long time and you know, debunking has been around for a long time. Uh, I think the Daniel Loxton, did oh, yeah. an excellent article or, or a talk uh, about a debunker and a kind of a charlatan uh, who was selling like snake oil uh, back in, I think it was back in Roman times, like 2000 years ago. But you know, it's, and the, it was striking again in the similarity between what we see now and what we see then. You, you see a charlatan like giving all these false claims about things and then you get somebody trying to debunk them. And uh, it, was, it was the same process, you know, even they didn't have the internet and they didn't have uh, newspapers uh, as such, but you, know, you still had the same things going on. Uh, and, and you look at th throughout history, you'll see parallels uh, with what's happening today. I'm, I'm just reading a book called uh, the, you know, the, the Splendid and the Vile, which is about the, the Blitz uh, in, in, in Britain when the Germans were bombing Britain 
And there was all kinds of misinformation and conspiracy theories that arose around that, uh, you know, around the start of, of World War II in, in, 19, in the 1939 and the early 40s. And you just, you just read about what happened behind the scenes uh, then, and you see all these like machinations of uh, people trying to get rumors and propaganda and things into the, the newspapers. So the, even the idea of like fake news uh, and, and uh, propaganda you know, obviously isn't new. And it's very, very similar uh, now to what, what it was then. Obviously it's changed in nature and in speed and to some degrees with quant in quantity with the internet. But uh, you know everything that is uh, everything that was old is new again. Just a new format, and it's more it's more readily able to be to be packaged and sold to people. One of the things you mentioned was a uh, one of the common things that happens to people who tend to fall into these rabbit holes is not only that they're in a maybe a stressful time of their life, or a you know maybe they're unemployed, maybe they're um, you know ill and there's you know they're more vulnerable at that time maybe they wouldn't have fallen for um, the conspiracy theory at a different point in their life but the other thing you mentioned was time people who have time and right yeah. now we seem to have an awful lot of spare time and we have an awful lot of time on social media and so can you talk about now what's going on with the, the COVID pandemic? Anybody who's watching this in the future, we're, we're recording this <laughs> during the, the, 2000, uh, the 2019, right, COVID-19, COVID that's what I'm sorry, I call it. But we're recording this in 2020, so it's been several days. I'm on, I think we're starting week 12 here in my house of, of lockdown, except for the grocery store and exercising. But tell us a little bit about this idea that yeah. things are ex escalating right now. I think this video will be dated by my, my bouffant hairstyle. <laughs> Everybody's got, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of COVID beards. That's what they're calling out there. You guys yeah. you look like they're shaving or you look the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, what we have here is a kind of a confluence of, of two, two big things. Uh, on the one hand, we have a lot of people are at home and have a lot of spare time because you know people are not commuting and uh, a lot of people are unemployed uh yeah uh, briefly well not briefly like suddenly and hopefully briefly and we also have this this incredible world-changing events of this this pandemic that is uh, swept across the world and you know killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people and it's, it's continuing to go and uh, it's creating creating lots of problems around the world and in around the united states and anytime you get a, a significant event that affects a lot of people or is of great interest to a lot of people, like 9-11, you're going to get conspiracy theories, theories about it. Uh, in part, that's because different people will try to exploit any event and they will try to frame it in a certain way and say, like, because of this, we need to do this. You know, because of this, we need to invade the Middle East or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are trying to deflect blame for things because when something bad happens, then people look for something to blame. And so people start trying to uh, say, you know, it's not our fault that that happened. You know, people were in power, but like, you know, it was the guy before us who did it or it was someone else. Or, so you're going to get this information. So you, you've got this combination of, a large event, a large world changing event, and lots of people at home. And so it's like the perfect, perfect storm for conspiracy theories to arise and not, not just arise, but just uh, to take hold. So it makes it very easy for people to create a conspiracy theory and it just spreads like wildfire mm -hmm. because people are looking for explanations and they have a lot of spare time. So even when you get things that are really ridiculous, like say the idea that coronavirus was caused by 5G uh, radio <laughs> towers, you know, which seems obviously like kind of a laughable idea, but a lot of people, you know, they don't know the science and a lot of people have, have heard that 5G is, uh, is harmful. And there's lots of websites that will tell you that 5G is harmful and that it's uh, doing all kinds of unknown things. And so from their perspective, why wouldn't, why wouldn't 5G be causing coronavirus or at least making it worse? Uh, so you've got this, 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 this I don't know, whole, whole bunch of things coming together in this kind of firestorm of, uh, of disinformation and conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. I remember um, some of the people here who are listening to this might know of an app that a lot of us have called Nextdoor. 
and it is a like a social network for people who live near each other and they don't have anything else in common with each other other than they live near each other um, and so a lot of conspiracy theories are being uh, are spreading from this network yeah. called next door a lot of people who haven't probably thought about it much in the past are are frightened um, and the 5g really has hit a button because it, coincidentally which a lot of people don't really understand about coincidences um how, how how likely the odds are that we have coincidences or as mark edwards always saying if we didn't have coincidences that would be really weird but uh, that 5g is being rolled out at the same time as we're starting to go into lockdown and so people are saying that 5g uh they created the coronavirus so that they could install the 5G, mm -hmm. which is going to lead to what barcodes on people, implants in our bodies, um, controlling us with mind waves. I, I mean, it, it, there's yeah. all kinds of things. I think the you, know, you were up next door, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, next door is this this site, a social media site essentially. But what it is, it's it's just the people who live very close to you so it's your neighborhood essentially mm -hmm. and then you have the surrounding neighborhoods as well so where i live there's, there's like this neighborhood of about like 50 houses 100 houses or so uh where we're all in this uh this next door thing and in it's interesting because unlike facebook where you get to choose your friends or twitter mm -hmm. you choose who you follow you're just getting a slice of people I'm sure they're kind of in the same demographic because of the, the neighborhood you're in, but there's still just this random slice of people. So you could get, be getting someone who two houses down is a, a, you know, a, a Trump supporter and you know, three houses down is like a, you know, a liberal and four houses down is some kind of uh, kooky crystal lady. And then five houses down is, is some guy who's uh, ex-military and preparing for the end of the world. So you get this this unusual slice of opinions mm -hmm. that you might not get uh, in Facebook. Because a lot of people they will kind of automatically filter that stuff out on Facebook. Uh, you won't you won't get the people who are like you know rabid supporters of something. But on these local community groups, you you do tend to get these. Uh, uh, it's almost like you're getting a more accurate assessment of how much conspiracies are out there because uh, you, you're getting this this more you know, almost a random sampling of people uh, from, from your neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's worthwhile actually, you know, dipping into what's going on on these, these local groups. I also, uh, to do that, I also join local groups on Facebook. So I'm getting all my, my, my neighbors in the county uh, talking on things, and it's not just my friends talking about things. And you see things cropping up. You see in my, which is my local uh, neighborhood watch, uh, Facebook group, people start to talk about chemtrails, <gasps> or they will start to talk about 5G, uh, or they'll talk, talk about vaccines. And it's interesting both to get a, get a handle on what's going on in society in terms of you know, how, how prevalent these, these things are, but it's also an opportunity that you can use to actually you know, kind of push back a little bit. So, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I politely something yeah because you may politely. run into these people again <laughs> you will run <laughs> Indeed, into like them I, again. I live, you I may live need their services them. to help you find your lost dog so you must be polite i sometimes think about that because you know i have to hire plumbers occasionally and i'm you know this i live in a small county and a small community and so like the plumber that i might be hiring to fix my my drain might be somebody that i've been arguing with about chemtrails <laughs> And uh, there's no way of knowing because you know, quite often they, you know, they're, just, they're just regular folk, a lot of these people. They mm -hmm. just happen to have these strange beliefs. And a lot of them have, have regular job, jobs. You know, there was one lady I knew her, who I was arguing about, chemtrails, and, uh, and she got quite angry with me. And, but she, she owns the local truck rental company, and I oh, had to go lovely. and rent a U-Haul rent a from her at one point. <laughs> Uh, which we didn't we just didn't talk about the other stuff once we did she know it was you the guy that she had been arguing with about him I, I wasn't entirely sure but you know my name was on the on the rental form so uh it could have been so yeah you, you the local community is an interesting uh kind of uh, slice of life mm -hmm. obviously it's not it's not a full slice of the american uh, psyche but it's it's a, a slice of the local psyche and it's good to actually look at that as being representative uh, of what's going on it is fascinating. I, when the, the pandemic, the lockdown started, 
Um, I, I rarely ever engage with anybody on uh, Facebook or social media of any kind argument wise. I, I just feel like I have much better use of my time somewhere else. And so I try not to because I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have trouble letting go and I'm going to say something I shouldn't. And with a name like Gerbic, I mean, it's going to follow me around. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't get away by being Susan Smith or something like that, but Susan Gerbic, that's so Googleable. And so uh, one man posted that the local Catholic school in our neighborhood was going to get a 5G tower and they were putting it on there. And he just kind of said it just like, oh, they're going to be, they're getting a tower put on, just wanting everybody to know. And most of the posts after that were good, wonderful. My cell phone coverage yeah. is going to get better. And I thought, yes, my area doesn't have a bunch of crazy kooks. And then the guy started saying, well, I just want everybody to know, I wish they'd asked permission and told us first. And so I came in trying to use reason, reasonable, like I said, I don't have the skill that maybe some people who constantly are talking to people on the internet have. So I was trying to be, trying to channel my better Susan. And I answered him saying, so I don't understand. Why would they need to let you know? I mean, if they were going to be, was there a lot of traffic from them putting cars in the, you know, like, was there mm -hmm. a lot of reason? I mean, why would they need a, to get your permission or to tell you? Because that doesn't make sense. Yeah. I'd be like, we're going to paint the building and, and it's going to be this color brown. Does anybody care? You know, I thought, why are they asking? And the man came back and he says, well, there's a lot of people who have issues with 5G. And I said, well, that doesn't mean it's real. I said, and, he, and so he started posting things up there, like some kind of NPR interview saying people are concerned about 5G. And I said, well, that's nice. They're concerned about 5G. That doesn't mean there is a concern to be worried about. And so he was getting himself, digging himself in. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to come across as being extremely sympathetic, except that like almost, uh, what's the word for it? Not, kind of mean spirit because I knew exactly where he was going and, and mm -hmm. I was trying to pretend I didn't. And other people came in and said, you know, the same way that, well, what's, what's the big deal? And he says, well, I just wish they had told us. And I said, told you why? And yeah, well there was no real answer. He, it felt like he was thinking it out for the first time himself. He hadn't really considered it. And, and of course I pulled the, the skeptic line burden of proof on him. And I tend to be doing that a lot lately with psychics. It's, well, you've just made a claim that there's some problem with 5g. Can you back that up? The, of course well, the thing can. is they probably, you probably could back yourself up because there's kind of in a way, kind of a parallel world of, mm -hmm. uh, of science that that exists out there, and if you search for things like safe levels of five G radiation, most of the results you will find uh, are sites that give safe levels of five uh, G radiation that are almost a thousand times lower than the actual safe levels. Hmm. Uh, the 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 national safe level of of electromagnetic radiation is something like nine milliwatts per meter squared. And yet there's this whole industry of people who sell meters that don't even go up anywhere near nine watts per meter squared. <laughs> they go up to about 20 milliwatts, uh -huh. uh, which is like one five hundredth of that amount. And I've got one of those meters. Uh, it's called the Trifield meter. It's, it's famous both for uh, you know 5G towers and also for ghost hunting. And if you switch it on to uh, oh really ghost uh, hunting <laughs> here so here it just went pop like six ooh, or something there's like that. There's a ghost in the room with you. So it looks like you know there's lots of nasty stuff going on uh, in my room right now because you you can see this meter and probably if I move it closer to my monitor it would be going even more uh, crazy. Look at that it's gone all the way to the top there. Oh my gosh! Uh, I'm so scared. it looks like I'm going to die. But this is this is a meter that a lot of people use as if it's some kind of like scientific measure of things that are causing you harm. Uh, if you measure what's happening on the outside of your microwave, it's going to re read about like four or five or something on this that goes up to 20. Uh, but you know, inside your microwave, it's, it's literally like a hundred thousand times uh, higher th than that level. But they're, they're equating the two things as if there's some kind of dangerous leakage of radiation coming out of your, your microwave. And there's a huge, a huge ecosystem online 
of uh, people who are doing things like selling you these meters and then selling you remediation things like they will they will sell you services they will come and paint your room uh, with conductive paints to block out oh. 5g or all the other oh, the other things uh, or they will uh, they will come in and they will scan your entire house and find the, the 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 spots and they will change the wiring so it has it's less coils in it so it, it creates less of a less of a field and that they're making money from it and I've for most of them heard of this. that's great most oh. of them actually yeah they they actually believe it though the people they're not really scamming you as such I think a lot of the people who are actually selling these things and the people who make these meters, you know, if you look at the manual for this meter, it will tell you uh, the safe level is blah, 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 uh, like less than one uh, milliwatt when the actual level is, is 9,000 milliwatts. Uh, and they, they genuinely believe it. And so you, you've got this, this whole other world of lots and lots of people and uh, they will point to some scientific studies that have been done that you know, show some little correlation between you know, exposure to cell phone radiation and, and cancer, which you know, aren't statistically meaningful, but they, they, they glom onto them. Uh, and the, it's become almost like a parallel world. Uh, so when you're talking to somebody about this and you're trying to show them the facts it's very difficult because they've got this huge base of information that they think uh, supports their ideas and they've got loads and loads of like you know good good looking articles things that are scientific papers and you know journals and 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 doctors and scientists on their side and then you've got like mainstream science telling them that no you can have a thousand times that much and you'll be fine so how are you going to shift them from from one side to the other, it's uh, it's quite a challenge, and it's something I wasn't really aware of until uh, fairly recently when I started looking into the five G thing because of the coronavirus, and I discovered this this whole whole subculture of, of people. And now, of course, it shows up in my YouTube feed. I keep getting YouTube videos of people saying like, uh, "Hey, yeah. how to how to shield your windows from five G?" Yeah, the the um. I know I recommended this to you, Mick. I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch it yet, but the New York Times has a new podcast out. They've done six episodes called Rabbit Hole. And um, it's really well worth listening to. They talked to uh, the first four episodes. I think they're talking to a young man who um, is addicted to YouTube. And they were able to download his whole algorithm, everything, all the videos he's ever watched. And they were able to piece it together what he was watching that made him go into a new mm -hmm. a new person who introduced a new thought into his mind and he was a typical liberal kind of student and he became very far right and then how he got into the rabbit hole how he got out of it and they're interviewing him the whole time it was really interesting they talked to youtube they talked to the man who a uh, frenchman a man in france who is the person who created the algorithm to make the next video come up and he didn't understand at the time what it was he was creating to recommend the next one because of course with uh, youtube it's all about getting people to watch and so yeah. your next thing on there is the next one and so it seems like this is becoming better um i think maybe because of covid that we're seeing this this influx of people with these conspiracy theories what do you think about that yeah i think i think it is improving because uh youtube are, are deliberately now trying to downplay these uh these conspiracy videos youtube uh they, they did a study as to how much of these fringe topics actually contributed to the their bottom line basically and it was actually quite a small percentage of the, the viewership hmm. yeah, if you compare the uh uh, the really big YouTube influencer channels like, you know, PewDiePie or someone like that, who's got like a hundred million uh, subscribers uh, to the conspiracy people. It's a very, very small number of views. Mm -hmm. So from a, a profit perspective, like what they had before was kind of this blunt tool where they wanted to essentially encourage and use the addictive natures of videos to hook people into things. This is something we did in the video game industry. Uh, and back when I was starting making video games, the addictiveness of a video game was seen as a very, very positive thing. Mm. And you would try to make your video game more addictive 
Uh, it didn't really have the same negative connotations back then because you know video games were just fun little toys. So if you have a, a video game that's addictive, then it would be great. Uh, now we know that video game addiction is actually a real problem, and people do get addicted to video games and end up spending like you know a good chunk of their life and mm -hmm. kind of ruining their careers and social lives from being addicted to video games. And so this is something you try to address. You don't want to have that unhealthy addiction uh, to video games. But you know, we would just do whatever it, it took to make the video game more addictive. So if you're doing something that, like a game that involves like war, uh, war and killing people, you might do things like make uh, like a more gory way of killing people because it makes the game more addictive because it might, it makes fires the neurons because people respond to violence in a certain way. So you might end up just going down that path of making your games more and more violent mm -hmm. because it makes them more and more addictive to a certain crowd. And that's something that was happening uh, with YouTube because they weren't thinking about the consequences. They were just thinking of this single metric right. of uh, how can we get repeat views? What's the changes to this algorithm that we can make that make it increase the numbers and they would they would do a b testing where they would take two versions of the algorithm and they would give them different weights to the different parts of uh, the equations that they use and then they would see the one that uh, over uh, a number of people created more more uh, repeat views and then they would use that and so it was this kind of blind evolution of the algorithm into something that uh, became very very effective at sucking people down the rabbit hole and now, alas, they've kind of realized that letting nature take its course on this algorithm was not uh, in everyone's best interest. And they are making actual um, manual tweaks to it to, to stop that type of thing happening. A social responsibility, you know. Yes. And uh, yeah, I think it's not just a social responsibility, it's actually a kind of a bottom line for them thing for them because they, they have advertisers who don't want to be associated with that type of thing. And so they have to demonetize. Uh, these not exactly demonetize, but kind of not have as many adverts on them. So these things become less and less valuable, and then they have to spend money serving them to people. So they actually can save money as well. So it's not entirely altru altruistic on uh, on YouTube's part here. Yeah. Well, and also, and they mentioned this in the rabbit hole that the woman YouTuber who came and shot up a uh, shot up YouTube a couple years ago. I mm -hmm. mean, there's a lot of. Uh, negative publicity i mean that kind of maybe said to youtube hey you know we need to <laughs> we need to start thinking about the you know our actions and it's not just a profit line you know this this can really harm people and the cutie pie pewdie pie um with the uh, new zealand shooter uh incident you guys yeah. will hear about this if you listen to the podcast rabbit hole after you've listened to mix podcast <laughs> Thank you very much. You gotta watch them. You gotta listen to them together. You can't listen to just one or the other. Yeah, I think there's as much better, much better production values than than mine does. Mine is just me talking to some person, and there's this. Uh, I think it's <laughs> much great put together. I think. You know, and and um, just for I mean, there's so much I want to cover with you, and I want to get to a point where people can ask questions. So let me let me sure. ask you. Um, I want to move to the to um, talking to people and getting him out of the rabbit hole and I want to mention this really quickly and not just because I see Brian Dunning's name in here but I often recommend Brian Dunning's Skeptoid to people as uh, another way of talking to people about getting out of conspiracy theories and he has a lot of experience um, in this in this world of skepticism and he talks about a lot of variety of things that I've never heard of, you know, um, oh, you had one that I was going to mention too. Don't let me forget to get to that. But um, that I thought was really interesting that I haven't really thought about. But um, where was I going with this? Kindness, how you talk to people. And one of the things Brian Dunning points out is that we don't even speak the same language as people. I mean, I know we're both mm -hmm. speaking English, but the idea of um, theory, energy, uh, science, evidence, all those words mean something to us, but it means something different to other people. I mean, they don't have the same science background or lack of background or whatever as everybody else. So to, to getting people out of this rabbit hole, Dunning, I'm quoting, hopefully correctly, since he's listening, is that um, you need to kind of come up with the same you know, talk about something that you probably agree on, like maybe you both believe that Bigfoot is not real. So come up from that ranks, talk to them about it to help create some kind of uh, 
a bridge, some way of having a common words, common, common language, and then establishing the rules of conversation of some sort. And, and you can, over time, help people come out of the rabbit hole. So now, now I've said that, I want to hear your thoughts on, on getting people out of the rabbit hole, or do they tend to get themselves out of the rabbit hole? Is Maybe those are two different subjects, getting your friend out, or how do people get out on their own? Well, it's kind of a combination of things. Uh, people get out of the rabbit hole a lot quicker if they have a friend to help them. And uh, the most important thing you can do to help people is just keep the channels of communication open. I think a lot of people, they, they leap into, uh, uh, you know, if they find someone that they disagree with or someone brings up a topic that they know is wrong, you, you leap into the debunking and you say, that's nonsense. You know, this, You're stupid. Just look at this, these articles. What an idiot uh, you are, yeah. yeah and it, it's not, not even like if, if going that far, obviously, is going to be a very negative thing, but uh, it's just kind of like showing them all the information that they need all in one go and showing them stuff that uh, is kind of beyond their comprehension in a way because they, they not that they can't comprehend it eventually, but they, they don't have the shared language, like you said, to, to, to talk about it. So you've, you've got to start by just establishing good communication and understand that you're talking about the same thing. So the best way of doing that is really just asking them questions about their belief and trying to flesh out why they believe what they believe um and that in itself can be a valuable tool it's like mm -hmm. you know uh, there's a guy called the, the uh anthony magna bosco who's mm -hmm. the street epistemologist yeah he's and great. he uses th this technique which is essentially is asking people why they believe a certain thing uh, that's kind of what it mostly boils down to and getting people to think about why they believe a certain thing is a very valuable thing but that's something you can kind of do over time like initially what you want to do is Maintain effective communication. I have a three-step process in my book, okay. which is really, really simple. Like the first Please step is maintain effective, maintain effective communication, step one. Uh, step two is supply useful information. And step three is give it time. And that's really all there is to it, uh, the, the, the approach. Now you can drill down into the various things in more detail. <clears throat> like what useful information do you give and how do you maintain effective communication? But really, if you keep talking to people and you keep giving them information, which is useful context and useful explanations of questions that they have and simple factual debunkings or factual falsifications of, of beliefs that they have, it does have an effect. And this is something that is difficult for people to, to recognize when they start doing this because they, they see someone who is completely immune to reason. They seem like there's no way they're ever going to get through to this person. You throw all these things at them, it just bounces off. But over time, it does actually have an effect, and especially if you're having a good conversation with them. You're talking with them and not just at them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's like uh, the politeness over the Thanksgiving dinner a little bit. Let's, let's have rules of engagement, and, and depending on how much time you have with them to be able to discuss it. I've had two uh, women come to me in the last month or so that have asked me for a link to something out there who will, I can give this link to them that they can give to their friend or their family member who is really heavily into this rabbit hole. I mean, the QAnon or other things. Um, and I've engaged with these people who are asking me this help. And, I, and right off the bat, I've, I've kind of asked them, so is this a normal behavior for them? I mean, to, to kind of fall into these, these, this path of conspiracy theories, or is this a, kind of a, a newish thing? Like mm -hmm. they've always been really rational and all of a sudden now they're starting to think about QAnon. And in both cases, these women have said that, no, this has been a long history. It's been other things in the past and now it's this new obsession. And I, what I've explained to them is I don't think there's a link out there that I would be able to give them that they would number one, read or listen to or, or trust. So I don't think that that is helpful, just giving them a link and thinking that they're gonna suddenly no. read it or, or no. whatever. But I, in, in the two cases I've had, I thought it was medical problems. I mean, they either taking a combination of medication that's messing with their minds or something, or they definitely have much more serious problems than just they've watched a video that has made them fall into a rabbit hole. So in both cases, I suggested to them that it is probably best that they need to see 
out medical help to you're probably not going to be able to get him to say go you there's something wrong with your brain go see the doctor what i suggested to him is to say it like this that you know let's rule out medication problems like maybe you're taking supplements and you're taking this medication and that's causing some things to happen some confusion and it's not you it's probably might be your medication but let's talk to a doctor first and let the doctor kind of sort it out and that's mm -hmm. how i approached it with these people and they seem they said oh you know i hadn't really thought of it that way they seemed to think i had some magic doo -doo, you know link and i'm like no this seems a lot more serious than somebody reading a book would solve yeah yeah, unfortunately, there's some people. You probably that, get a lot uh, of that, right? You no, know, I, I get people like across the entire spectrum of people who are just kind of a little bit curious about the JFK assassination, all the way to people who believe that they're being followed in the supermarket by shape shifting, shifting lizards. Oh. Uh, but you know, there are obviously some people at the far end of the spectrum who do have mental illness, mm -hmm. and it's a very, very difficult thing to deal with because if you people who are mentally ill before they get to the stage when they recognize that they have some mental illness problems, they're very, very resistant uh, to, to any suggestion that that could be a, the cause. And so they will fight back against suggestions that they will see the doctor or that their medications might be the issue. Uh, so it, it can be very difficult to, to kind of persuade people that that might be a factor. And it is a, a, not really something that I personally try to get into because there's so many issues around uh, essentially trying to treat someone who is mentally ill. Right. If you're not actually a mental illness specialist, uh, that so my advice there is kind of, kind of like your advice in a way, like I would suggest people, you know, follow the advice of their doctors if they have, they have issues kind of relating to their own health. But if they have uh, some super paranoid delusions uh, about being followed or people breaking into their houses and things like that, voices in their heads, there's not a lot that I can personally do about it uh, if, they are, if they're resistant to treatment. So there is going to be a small segment of the population that, that is like that. And I think for the friends and families of those people, it's going to kind of come down to management of those people mm -hmm. rather than curing them. You've got to learn how to live with them uh, you know, it doesn't have to be this constant fight against their, uh, their delusions. Uh, it could be just something that you end up just living with. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have this, this crazy aunt Sally who believes that, uh, she talks to God every morning. Uh, oh. uh like, you know, if, if you remember the, the movie, a beautiful mind, mm -hmm. uh, about John Nash, he Beautiful ended movie. up, uh, in towards the end of the movie. I mean, it's not really a spoiler as such, but, uh, he kind of came to terms with the the hallucinations that he had, right? And he kind of you know realized that they were just hallucinations, and he just accepted that they would they would happen. And you know his mental illness remained, but he managed to deal with it. And with a lot of people, what you're going to try to get to is not curing their mental illness. It's going to be finding a way of getting through life with that uh, with that disability. Mm -hmm. I, absolutely. I think that in the cases of the people I was talking to, um, I felt what I felt like they left with was that, um, you know, be sympathetic to, to your family member who has this beliefs, these beliefs, because I can't imagine how frightening it must be for that person to think that maybe they're being followed through the grocery store by shape shifting, you know, li li reptoids. I mean, they, they, you can't necessarily reason yourself out of it. We're all not John Nash. Yeah. And so that for them to understand, you to have some sympathy towards this person, this is a frightening time and a frightening, um, you know, if you feel like you're being abducted by aliens at night when you go to sleep, um, you know, there's some people might actually like that, that makes them feel special, but that would be very frightening not to be able to go to sleep at night or to worry that your children are going to be abducted from you or something of yeah. that sort. And let's have a little sympathy. Yeah. They, they, they need probably some more help than, than, um, than you can offer them. And like I said, they're not going to be able to read a link and it's going to talk them out of it or something, but have a little sympathy that this is frightening and this is a bad, bad place this person might be in. Yeah. I think, I think with things like that, uh, you, you can, 
approach it with empathy uh, and understanding and respect, but that doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. It doesn't no. mean you have to pretend to believe them. And a lot of people think that uh, that's what I'm talking about when I say like, you know, treat people with respect. It doesn't mean uh, respect their ideas as in that might be true. You can respectfully disagree with someone and you can respectfully tell them that you don't think that's what's happened, but you can still say like, uh, you know, respect your your belief about it, but I don't think that is true. And maybe we could talk about that and try to figure out why I think this is false and you think that it's true. And you know, where, where is our disagreement? Uh, what, what, what evidence is our disagreement based on? And what experiences is our disagreement based on? Uh, so you don't have to agree with people to respect their positions. Right. Just to sympathize. Now I'm going to break for just a, a second and let you guys know I haven't had this occur to me before, but somebody's trying to get in the room that's just a number. It's so, oh, they disappeared. Okay, never mind. Hmm. I was going to say, I don't know if I let them in, it's going to be a troll or what it was going to be. I was just going to break. Let Jeanette, you Wilson. Jeanette Wilson found you because you're using Joanne Nelson's name. <laughs> Jeanette Wilson. Oh, yeah. You guys might notice that I do have a different name on here, and there's a very valid reason for that. Um, let's really quickly mention the, the, the thing that happened to you recently in that, um, oh, here comes, here comes Linda Rosa. Okay, so this is a real legitimate person I actually know, so that's great. Can I, can I do a follow-up to just what you're talking about sure. right before? So Mick and I actually talked about this. My wife is a psychotherapist, and she has a client who considers herself a targeted individual. So it's, it's which is a thing, a, which is a thing. I had never heard of it, it before. She slipped my wife a USB drive in her office, told her not to open the envelope it was in until she got home and don't talk to anybody about it. And then I put it in the computer after scanning it. And it was a giant PDF document, very roughly assembled, probably did it herself with all photographs of things in her house. She had taken apart to look for bugs, I assume, and also text pages and also links to Facebook and other things to prove it was right. And, and the, the problem with this kind of individual is like my wife cannot challenge her because she just will never come back because then my wife will become part of the conspiracy. So really, in order to help her at all, all she can do is sort of pretend it is real and help her deal with it as best she can or she just loses her, which is I'm sure it's a very tidy subset of people like this, but it is a real subset. And mm -hmm. I went online and looked at this now. And this is like a whole thing, just like the flat earthers now have a self-reinforcing thing where maybe, you know, before the internet, you're sitting alone in a room and you're thinking these weird thoughts. Now you get reinforcement that other people believe it too. And right. like, you're never going to drop it. It's a culture. It's, it's, it's You've joined a community. And I think when you, when you talk to the big footers or the, the people in um, the flat earth community, what, you've, what you notice is that, um, did you just change your name to James Brandy? You oh, that was about not. an hour ago. Oh, I didn't notice. That was it. because this person logged in as Brian Dunning, and we don't really know it's Brian Dunning. So. Oh, that's true. It could be. It could be. I, you else. weren't looking at the chat. I said, "Hey, anybody can name themselves anything. How do I know it's Brian?" Yeah, Dunning? I have it. I have it. Oh, look, there's there's and, 23 and things in the chat. I didn't even notice that. I'll have to look at that. Somebody will have to tell me if there's anything I need to ask. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeff actually had a question right right above the end there. Well, Jeff's not here. Oh yes, he said he, that was part of it. He said he had to leave early. Oh, we'll answer the question in a minute. Um, I wanted to ask about. Um, I probably was on a on something talking about something really rational just a second ago, and I've forgotten. Um, we pulled off a nice psychic sting last night, and it was ended at three thirty in the morning, and I had to get up at seven to be able to talk to somebody from the UK about a TV um, Netflix thing on psychics. So. If I'm not completely 100% there, that's why. And that's why my name is Joanne Nilsson. Um, the CNN uh, chip, no, Chris Chilzera, I don't even know how to say his name. So there's these UFO videos that were, were, were released by NASA or whoever it was who releases them several years ago and have been thoroughly discussed and explained year, uh, over time. This person from CNN wrote a article He's kind of an opinion writer, politics opinion writer, and he was talking about um, these videos as if they're brand new and that they just were here on the scene. And you, Mick, immediately turned around and said, here's a video, like three minutes long, a compilation of, of what it is we're looking at. You didn't get into the science. You just got into yeah. the basics. And it was really timely, really brilliant. And it was just like, that's where we need to be is like, okay, I'm reacting quickly and I'm going to put this together that there, this is 
old news, <laughs> not new. It was, and I did actually have to move qu quickly on that because I, I knew it was going to be a, like a big media story. Uh, what, what happened was two years ago, I think mm -hmm. in December 2017, uh, the, there was a story where these videos were released, kind of leaked by this, this organization called the To The Stars Academy, which is headed by Tom DeLong, who's the former lead singer of uh, Blink-182 weird uh, organization but it has a bunch of interesting people in it and they'd released these videos back then they kind of semi-officially got them uh, released by the navy but then the navy uh just just a few uh, couple of months ago did this this another release of these videos where they did the actual official release mm -hmm. of the videos because the first one wasn't proper they didn't go through the proper channels and the media picked up on this as being uh oh, navy admits that aliens are real and so you got loads and loads of news stories along those lines of people saying that the, the you know, UFOs are real. And uh, you know what these videos are? They just show little black blobs, little white blobs in the distance. And you can't really tell very much about them and they don't really look particularly interesting. <laughs> and I, I spend a lot of time analyzing the videos, figuring out what they were and what they were not, because people will make claims about them. Like one mm -hmm. of them says, they say that this one video shows a rotating flying saucer. Uh, and I did a lot of analysis showing that it doesn't actually show a rotating flying saucer. It shows a glare, which is a kind of an optical illusion or an optical effect of the camera. Uh, so I, I'd done all this work beforehand and kind of like what I was talking about at the start is, you know, I'd done all this good work, but it was all in this series of disconnected videos explaining individual Very technical. things. Yeah, technical videos. Uh, and, and I didn't have, I couldn't just say, Here, here's the playlist of my videos. <laughs> just watch these like, you know, hour and a half of, of, of videos. Because there's about 15 of them. All into the rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, so, so what I did was I... Uh, I, I just sat down and spent like uh, spent the morning, like a few hours, uh, making this three-minute video. It takes takes several hours to make a three-minute video mm -hmm. if you want to make a good one, uh, and just did a, a summary of what my research has shown to this point with just the most the best illustrative examples and links so that people could go and check things for themselves. And because that was done during the media wave. I just kind of caught the crest of that wave. That video did really well and it got hundreds of thousands of views and uh, got various follow-up things. I've got like two documentary crews talking to me now about, oh, wonderful. Uh, about this type of thing. And I've had various media appearances uh, for, because of it. So striking while the iron is hot and doing a good focused explanation, I think it's very, very important. And the more timely you can make your uh, debunking videos, if you make debunking videos, uh, the better. Right. Even if I think we found this, um, Rob is probably uh, as also an editor, um, that editor uh, uh, writes articles for Skeptical Inquirer. Sometimes we write things about things that probably people aren't really all that interested in. You know, who, I mean, who knows? It's not going to have a huge following. But having that out there, maybe the, the thing that somebody will find, especially if we can get it onto a Wikipedia page. And maybe someday somebody's going to go like, you know, maybe somebody in the Trump cabinet right now is, is about to talk about a psychic that probably gets a hundred views a day on their mm -hmm. Wikipedia page. And that might be all of a sudden is brought into the forefront and boom, it's the next hot thing. And because we've already released information about that, that's where everybody goes. And like you yeah. said, yeah. you couldn't have created all those videos that you had, those technical videos that you had, uh, had created before you couldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, that was two, two years of, of on and off uh, video creation right. and lots and lots of discussions on, on my forum. And, and not, not people really aren't going to necessarily look at those videos, those no. technical videos, and understand them if they don't have a good grounding in science. Okay, so let me, let me go to this really quick because you, had, um, you do have a, you have a Facebook group that, that talks about your podcast and your book, and it's mm -hmm. kind of like where people can discuss things. And one of the things you had posted on there recently was that you're thinking of putting on a, writing a second book, which I definitely think you should be writing a second, a third, and a fourth book. But um, one of the questions you asked the community was about science. And you were thinking that maybe the second book that you're going to write would be about the science behind mm -hmm. some of these conspiracy theories. My suggestion was I like the interviews because I'm a people person. I like to hear yeah. about people. And I also said that I think the science video, science, writing about science isn't as interesting as videos on science where we can see it being done. And um, one of the questions that came up was you were talking about 
how can we make science trustworthy again? And I thought, well, you know, is, do people really not trust science? I mean, it feels like there are a lot of people out there who don't trust science, but I'm kind of wondering if, and this is getting a long question because again, I have had very like three hours sleep of, uh, <laughs> of are we seeing these conspiracy minded people like on Nextdoor and so on more because now they have a platform and they have a way of vocalizing it more. Have they always been there or are they just feel like now their opinion is valid and maybe I should talk about my 5G worries or my uh, tech. I, I don't think that science necessarily yeah. is untrustworthy that I think that most people probably do trust most science, but these opinions we we're seeing now are just feel like they're more out there. That's, well, that's look, my point. You look at some of the uh, conspiracy theories that are out there that are kind of mainstream conspiracy theories, like the idea that uh, fluoride, fluorine, uh, is it fluoride? Yeah. fluoride, fluorine in water fluorine, is, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's for your teeth, but some people say it's toxic and there's actually, you know, it's, it's on the fringes, it's not the fringes, it's kind of like there almost is a strong debate in the scientific community about that, uh, depending on, on your perspective. But that's been around for a long time. Anti-vaccine, that's been around for even longer. Like the anti-vaccine stuff goes back to the smallpox vaccine uh, mm -hmm. when they were inoculating people with cowpox mm -hmm. uh, and things derived from that. And they were thinking that the, there's cartoons, you've probably seen them, there's cartoons back from, I don't know when it was, like the 1700s or whatever, uh, of people getting uh, smallpox vaccinations and being uh, turning into cows and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the 5G stuff goes back a long way. Uh, the, when there was a disease, a proposed disease called, I think, neurasthenia, which was uh, caused in part by telegraphs, the telegraph wires. The idea that people were getting too much information at once because of the, the, the telegrams. Oh, wow. <laughs> And so you can say that's the same thing like now with the, the internet, like people are getting you know, too much information and it's making them crazy. Well, people were saying the exact same thing back about, about, about telegrams in the 1800s. Wow. So <clears throat> I think a lot of this isn't new. I think we're just seeing kind of different, different takes, different perspectives and different amplifications of certain aspects of, of uh, feelings and ideas that people have always had. You know, the term Luddite mm -hmm. uh, dates back to, I think, I don't, I'm not 1700s? Sure. Probably, England. You know, seven, I think the 1700s, yeah, when uh, workers were like uh, opposed to new technology because they were going to lose their jobs. Away, yeah, taking away their jobs, which is like, obviously mm -hmm. a valid concern, but just the idea of someone being a Luddite is being anti technology. And you get the same things now with people being anti technology. And uh, there's movements of people who want to. You get get away from uh, the internet and things like that, and that kind of ties into the whole five G thing because they think that radiation is bad for you. People think that television is mind control. You know, that idea is an old idea. Uh, the the term the idiot box, you know, dates back a long time into the early, early days of television, uh, because it, they think it's a, a box that makes people stupid, and uh, it's very easy to go from you know that that observation to the idea that it's some kind of deliberate plot by the government. And, and scientists, uh, the term ivory tower is as a long provenance and it, it means someone who is like, you know, separate from society and doesn't really have the interests of the common man at heart. And you know, those scientists in their ivory tower don't know what they're talking about. So you still got, you've got this kind of distrust of science in a way that goes back a long, a long way. Uh, and what's happening now, I think, is you're getting an amplification of these things in part because you get more people who are not getting their information from mainstream sources. You get, you're getting this gradual decay of mainstream news. Uh, if you look at the demographics of like CNN and uh, even like things like ABC News, it definitely skews towards the older generations. Mm -hmm. I think the average Fox News viewer is, is in their seventies, but the average CNN viewer isn't, isn't much younger than the average uh, Fox News viewer. Hmm. Um, so you're getting a whole new uh, wave of people who are getting the information in different ways. And some people are saying that Joe Rogan is the new mainstream media. You know, Joe Rogan has the most popular podcast out there. He just signed a deal uh, with Spotify for $100 million. 
and he has a huge audience. His uh, videos regularly get over a million views and they're just long form interviews with just him chatting with one person. Uh, and yet he's, he's hugely influential in, in what he does. He has presidential candidates on there. And there's other people who have very, very large audiences. And you compare the size of Joe Rogan's audience to like typical viewership figures uh, for things like CNN news stories or even, even, even things like ABS, ABC and CBS news is really getting up there. You're getting more people getting yeah. their information from things like podcasts and websites mm -hmm. than you are from these mainstream news sources. So it becomes easier to, to not have this kind of monolithic a uh, set of agreed knowledge and have all these kind of this fracturing of knowledge and people coming at things from different ways. But then again, I think there is still, you know, there's a very strong uh, basis of science in the scientific uh, community. Uh, and they're still there. It's still to a degree in an ivory tower, uh, but there still is kind of this, this, uh, this thing that people rely upon science, like people are relying upon actual science uh, in, in society. And I think yeah, Joe Rogan, knows that there is good science and there's bad science and uh, other people do too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, because I think it's fascinating, I had never heard of this before until I'd heard it on the Skeptoid episode. Um, and I, you know, we, GSOW wrote the Mick West Wikipedia page. And I don't remember this being on here, but I took a glance at this and you had created a online forum called morgellonswatch.com to dispel mm -hmm. the myths and misinformation surrounding the unconfirmed skin condition M morgellons is that how you say yeah. it can yeah, you mention can you mention way. that briefly because i remember hearing it on skeptoid a couple times and i was like wow wow is that the thing that has like like a yarn or something in your it looks like yeah. yarn and yeah. and and i think dunning says in the episode that it was probably just lint from your clothing or something you know i, I can't remember it's been a long time since i heard it but can you talk about that briefly because i find that really interesting yeah that was something i got into kind of before uh, the chemtrails even yes yeah, way totally Back different like, from what uh, you normal 2004 2005 there was kind of uh there's a, a thing called delusions of parasitosis yeah that carl think, just put, uh, typed it in there it's a very old condition you know, again, you can find references to it back in the literature, back to the 1800s. And what would happen is uh, people would think that they were being infested by things like mites or scabies or something like that. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they examined it, they couldn't actually find uh, any evidence of that. And they would look at their skin through magnifying glasses and then they would, they would, they would see things. They would kind of imagine they're seeing things or they would actually see things because if you look at your skin, you, you'll find little, little bits of dirt and things on it, you know, especially back in the 1800s when people weren't showering every day. Um, and then they would, they would collect these things off their skin and they would put them in a, a, a matchbox, typically. Take them to the doctor. It was like a little container, a box that had matches in it originally. And this became known in the literature as the, max, the matchbox sign. And oh wow! Doctors, I've never heard uh, of this. Like, uh -huh. Someone's coming into my office with a matchbox and they're saying, "Doctor, look at these things that I found." And the doctor will be like, "Oh yeah, I know what this is. I know where this is going." <laughs> and these people become obsessed by this thing, and they become they think this is the cause of their ills. And these are often people who actually do have something actually wrong with them. It's not just the, this this uh, delusion that they have. Mm -hmm. They're people who might have stuff like eczema, or they might have diabetes, or they might just be getting old. Uh, the there's, there's symptoms of the, the disease that are very consistent with things like, like menopause. When you have the menopause, uh, yeah, I, I haven't had it myself, but uh, apparently you, you get lots of discomfort and uh, uh, various symptoms that are the same on, this, on the list mm -hmm. of the Morgellons symptoms. So what it is, is the Morgellons is the modern version of that. People uh, have itching. They, they scratch themselves and it makes it itch more and they, uh, they end up with these sores on their skin, which we call the neurotic excoriations. Uh, and they think that there's a cause for that and they end up thinking that there are things inside their skin that are doing this, like little creatures. And then they look at their skin and they see fibers on the skin, often in the sores themselves, because you, you, they're sticky and they will get clothing fibers in there. Uh, tissues. If you take a tissue like a something like a, a regular Kleenex, if you actually you, could, you try this experiment, if you put it in a bright light like sunlight and you you rip it, you'll see this huge cloud of little bits of dust, which are actually fibers, and those are the, those look exactly like the ones that the Morgellons people find in the, in their uh, in their skin. 
you'd have a very bright backlit light for it to, to, be, to be visible. But the, there's lots of dust going into the air right now in front of you. Interesting. Uh, which is, is actually tiny little fibers. And if you look at them through the magnifying glass, it's little, little uh, paper fibers, cellulose fibers. And this, this whole community grew up around this idea. And uh, it was really based around this one woman who started this foundation, the Morgellons Research Foundation. And she originally said that her son had this disease. Uh, and she had been accused of uh, Munchausen's by proxy. And you know, there's no, no real resolution to what actually happened there. But she started this, this foundation. Uh, and then other people saw like, the list of symptoms that were given. And they say, oh, that fits what I have. Because you know, <laughs> they have three out of these 25 symptoms or they might even have 10 of these 25 symptoms because they're very common things like right. forgetfulness or uh, hair loss or aches and pains uh you know things that you know we're all uh, older people here mostly uh and hey. you know, <laughs> <laughs> we all have uh, aches and pains that we didn't have when we were in our 20s and some people think that there must be a cause for this. Well, it's knowledge. called old age. Yeah. <laughs> but then you're, you're, my eyesight's getting worse. So I have to wear reading glasses now. Oh, and, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, my, my hairline is receding a little bit. These are all symptoms of aging, uh, but there's also symptoms of various diseases. But people think that they, they have a disease and then they start mm -hmm. looking at their skin through a microscope and they find these fibers and then they think they have Morgellons. And then he got caught up because the media started doing stories about this because someone who joined the organization was a kind of a media specialist who made these little documentaries. And so he made these compelling little videos and then he fed them to the, the local news stories, the, the local news sites. And, and they, they started doing stories about it. Uh, which wow. was, was a, uh, and it, it just kind of became a thing from there. Uh, but then eventually it got such, it was such a big thing that the CDC did a study on it. And the CDC oh. tried to figure out, uh, you know, what is this Morgellons? And so they studied it and they were like, oh yeah, it's basically just delusions of parasitosis. You know, these people have existing skin conditions and there's no evidence that these fibers are anything other than clothing fibers. And that kind of ended it for the media. But the people who believe in Morgellons are still going and they still have a conference every year where they all get together and discuss the latest uh, really? research into the topic. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm never going to look at a Kleenex the same again. <laughs> it's, it's pretty dusty. <laughs> I have a question. There, there are a lot of naturopaths and uh, other kinds of quacks that uh, promote the idea of uh, parasitic infections in mm -hmm. wor the worried well. And there are various devices for zapping. Yeah. Uh, has that any kind of link with Morgellons? Yeah, that, that definitely overlaps. There's a thing called the Rife machine, which is um, yeah. you know, technology, an old technology, an old quack technology, and various variants of that. Um, but yeah, parasites and, and toxic things, you know, it's the same kind of mindset that people want to ascribe their ills to something, and uh, you know, I'd like to ascribe my ills to something so I could cure them. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to get any younger. But you know, th these are people who d who often do have significant health issues, and they're just it, it gets compounded by sometimes there is some mental illness involved, especially when it becomes this delusion that they have that uh, that they think there's an infection. It, it's often described delusions of parasitosis is described as a monosymptomatic delusion in that the people are otherwise perfectly fine uh, mentally. They just have this one delusion that, they, they, that they're, they're being infested by these things and they can often operate in society fairly well, even though they do have like this weird, weird mental illness. But then you see that with a lot of things, people mm -hmm. have very weird beliefs, like some people believe that angels are following them around and they, they operate just fine in society. Dead people are leaving pennies for them on the street. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this question from Jeff, and then we'll open it up to more questions. So Jeff, who had to leave earlier, I'm going to have to drop before the Q&A, but regarding perceived EM sensitivity, a work mm -hmm. friend's spouse has insisted that their new house be a Wi-Fi-free wait, wi -fi free environment. Yeah. Can you imagine that? They, draw, they drag Ethernet cables around behind them, which is admittedly a comical image, but clearly the spouse needs help as this is just the latest thing in a long series. How does one approach this in a family where these things just aren't talked about? That sounds like they got a bigger issue than 
than yeah. than this. They need to communicate. <laughs> it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing because, like I said, there's this this vast ecosystem of uh, of anti EMF community, and so they feel like they've got this huge basis of evidence that is backing up their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And some people take it further than others. Uh, I know people who have. You know, they, they turn off the Wi-Fi most of the time in their house because they, they think that it could be harmful. And uh, I don't really know what you would do to, to address that because you know, what I've done basically with you know, the person that I know is you just, you just live with it because it's not a huge uh, inconvenience for them. It's this kind of a quirk that they have that the Wi-Fi is switched off. It, it makes it a bit hard for them to back up their, their iPhones. But it's, it's not really a debilitating uh, thing. So you know, is it actually worth creating some kind of conflict there where, where you're this person, uh, uh, you're probably not going to get through to them. You're going to start uh, arguing with them and showing them things. And then they, they might like think that you're not taking them seriously, or they might think that you're, you're trying to brainwash them, or they might think that you're brainwashed, or that they'll spend hours and hours trying to justify their position. So you have to try to figure out, is it actually worth addressing this? You know, what kind of problems does it cause? Um, yeah, I think it can obviously get to be a lot worse if people start refusing to go out and uh, refusing to use anything electrical. You know, there's a character on the show, Better Call Saul, who didn't have any electricity in his house and he coated everything with tin foil and he had like, you know, aluminum foil inside his jacket and uh, wouldn't use uh, anything that was electrical. And if you're going that far, then, you know, essentially it's kind of become a mental illness. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things you could try, like, um, you know, this trifield meter that I had. I've kind of been wondering about, you know, whether I should take this around to my friend's house and show him just how much the Wi-Fi actually does and where it is. Because if you use it uh, with with things like your computer monitor, like it's it's giving like yeah, a few a few things. Yeah, I don't actually I think I have Wi-Fi in my room switched on. I guess it's my phone here, but uh, uh, it's switched off. But I I have Ethernet connection in my room because it's more reliable. But you could actually go around the house with a meter like this, and you could see that most of the time, you know, the Wi-Fi is very, very low level. It's going to be less than one. Like in the in the center of my room here, the level is like zero point zero zero five right now. You might so, be able to point it at the sun or something, and even show them that it's naturally well, occurring. You you can show them that yeah, you could still have Wi-Fi, but if if you're worried about the radiation, and if you think that, that this low level is actually dangerous, when the steps you can take to actually still use Wi-Fi, but keep the dangerous stuff further away. So I've got my, my Google Wi-Fi hotspot is in the next room, your sticky Google Wi-Fi hotspot in the garage, and then the Wi-Fi in your house, you won't even be able to measure it because it'd be so low, but you'll still be able to use uh, the Wi-Fi. So you could you could you could tell them still that you disagree that about these safety levels and you think there's lots of debate, but you know, if it's something that bothers you, you don't actually have to switch it off. You can actually have it at this very very low level uh, that's that's far away, and it's going to be less than the radiation you're getting off your your TV, for example. Right. So if you're not worried about your TV, then just put your Wi-Fi in such a situation that it's giving like uh, one tenth of the power of your TV. So you know, it might be worth trying. Yeah, channeling, channeling. Buy, Go can, ahead, Linda. You can always buy that person a protective amulet. <laughs> yeah, you probably have a whole set. Create a bubble around you. A little security. bubble. And, and I'm going to channel Dunning, uh, Dunning on Skeptoid again, and it go, comes back down to, you know, being able to communicate with people and have reasonable discussions with them and not like make them feel like they're stupid and idiot or something. And maybe again, defining the terms because their idea of energy and their idea of radiation means something completely different from what science means yeah. and, and, and maybe small doses. I think this is another thing Duns, Dunning says, and I'm sorry, Brian, I'm keep quoting you, but oh well, um, is that depending on what it is, like you just said, Mick, what is the issue? Is it just, is it something that's going to harm them today? I mean, is it some, some <laughs> kind of thing that they're, that they're participating in, like they're stopping their chemo or they're stopping their, you know, their, they're not vaccinating their baby and they're going to take the, you know, or whatever. Is it a dangerous mm -hmm. thing that is happening to them right now? Or it is it some kind of like a, like a belief in, in Sasquatch or something like that. That's a, that's a, I guess a lower level woo woo kind of thing. And depending on which, where they are on the spectrum of what the belief is, maybe you can, you have more time to deal with it or it's something you need to immediately react to. 
but if you have to immediately react to something, again, you need to have established some sort of relationship with them in some sort of way of having a dialogue with them respectfully where they will can save face and say, oh, you know, I hadn't really thought of it that way before. Thank you. Yeah. You know, let's let's talk about it a little bit more. I'll do some research, which means they go to Wikipedia. So hopefully the Wikipedia page is in good shape. <laughs> Yeah, I think like you can um, you can start straight away with 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 people if they're, they're, they've got some topic that's uh, you know like uh, out there. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to make much progress. But you know, if you do want to do things that are uh, you know important to debunk, then you need to find the kind of essentially fact checking that is as neutral as possible. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a source that they won't necessarily immediately reject. Like a right. lot of people will reject Snopes or they will reject Wikipedia because mm -hmm. I think that is part of the problem. So if you can find uh, a debunking from a source that they perhaps agree with, then that might be a good thing. Or the, somebody uh, they respect, like maybe a Joe Rogan or somebody that they have already felt that they yeah. have some sort of trust with. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, like yeah, you know, I mentioned in the book that people told me that because uh, Joe Rogan was listening to me, it made them listen to me because they they, they believed in Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. But there's also you you find debunking information from within the community itself, like the 9/11 conspiracy believers. Uh, a lot of them are very upset that there's a subset of the 9/11 community that thinks a plane did not hit the Pentagon and that it was in fact a cruise missile that hit the Pentagon. I, I hadn't so, heard that before. I listened, and then I listened to your podcast, and I was like, "There are people who think this. Wow, yeah, quite a lot. Of wow." People. And then there's a disagreement with them within the community. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the anti-planers or something. The, what do they call yeah, them? Yeah, the no planers, but no there's kind planers. of a subset that are no planers at the Pentagon. Uh, the most 9/11 truth people who are like kind of active in the community, they think that the World Trade Center was destroyed by controlled demolition. Uh, like there were actually bombs planted in the buildings. But then there's uh, one step beyond that along the spectrum is the people who think that the Pentagon was not hit by a plane, it was in, instead hit by a cruise missile and the basis on the whole looking a bit too small. And so the people who are just like the mainstream conspiracy theorists have actually created all of these very detailed and accurate debunkings of the no, no plane hitting the Pentagon. So on the, you've got these people who are conspiracy theorists debunking conspiracy theories. So if you want to have a good source to show your conspiracy theorist, you can often point to people within the community who debunk some of the more extreme claims. Because the people in the community don't want to be associated with these right. extreme claims because they think it, uh, it diminishes them by association. Uh, flat Earth people, oh. uh, some of the best Flat Earth debunkers are creationist Christians. There's, uh, there's a, a YouTube channel called The Creation Guys. It's not very popular, but they do some very good debunking of flat earth. Uh, but they're, they're young earth creationists. <laughs> but they think that flat earth you know, is, an, is an, uh, you know, an, an insult to God's grand design, so they debunk the flat earth. So you can actually get, uh, you don't necessarily have to go to Wikipedia. And sometimes you can't go to Wikipedia because they don't trust it. So right. if you can find a source that uh, debunks it, I think it's still doing good, even though, like you know, they're, they're pr proposing like other things as well, like the young know, creationists. But if they can debunk the more extreme thing, it moves people a little bit closer to the actual reality. So I've recently become a volunteer for an organization called Recovering from Religion, and one of the things we're taught is something I had not heard of before: street epistemology. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, he mentioned it earlier. Okay. So uh, yeah. So I, I actually typed out to Jeff. Method. And I said to Jeff, maybe, because uh, this one guy, Anthony Magnabosco, who's involved with our organization, has become sort of the well-known sort of expert in that. And he's got tons of videos on YouTube, including training ones, which we have to take in this organization, to teach you to, in a non-confrontational manner, try to challenge someone's strongly held beliefs, you know, without getting into a fight. So, I mean, it's, it's one th I put the link in the thing. It's one thing to look at if you have anybody yeah. in that situation. I, I interviewed uh, Anthony Magnabosco from my podcast uh, a few months ago. He's a very interesting chap and is very, very good at what he does. Yeah. He mostly uh, talks, started. the questioning I've seen is mostly religion, but he does talk about yeah. non-religious beliefs also, right? Yeah, people yeah, want to sometimes talk about, he talks about beliefs. Yeah, conspiracies sometimes and sometimes like, uh, like things like anti-vax. I think he occasionally brings up things that are a bit more pseudo-medicine, right. pseudo-science type things as well. But yeah, it's, it's good stuff. And uh, it's a good way of, of thinking about it. It's like asking people why they believe what they believe and, and asking them questions that lead them to think about their beliefs. Yep. And they're not just thinking about like 
claims of evidence and whatnot. In fact, he hardly ever brings up yep. the actual That's evidence. Right. Is, mm -hmm. is really talking about why people uh, form their beliefs. Uh, and his attempt is to move move the scale of right. sure and you know, how sure mm -hmm. are you and what sure you're believing. You? And he usually, mm -hmm. not all the time, but he usually asks that question up front, how sure are you? And they're 100%. And sometimes by the end of the conversations, they'll admit to maybe 70. You know, so that's pretty good yeah. in yeah. one conversation. They're hard five, to watch. Five minutes videos. long. They're just going to be excruciating the way they communicate with each other, trying to I mean, to watch, uh, where they're trying to come up with a dynamic and how I'm only going to talk to you for five minutes and you can leave at any time. Would you like a water? You know, and, and it just feels like, oh, this is taking forever, but it seems to be effective. Yeah, it's a slow, a slow process. And uh, speaking to everybody, yeah. same thing. Yeah, but I think especially well, the, the way he's doing it is is it's the fact that it is slow is why it actually works because mm -hmm. you're building upon one thing and you start out agreeing about something and then you, you move what the disagreement is along until you find something you genuinely disagree with and then you see you know why what's the pivot point here and then you're focusing on that and then when you start to understand why there is this actual disagreement then it kind of becomes clearer to, to either party, like where they might be wrong or where the other person might actually have a point. Mm -hmm. So this very gradual approach of starting out somewhere and getting closer and closer to the disagreement is a good way of doing it. I, I totally agree. I think that, and I like how he, he, like Rob said, they put out the number first, give me a number between one and 10. And then he does it again. Cause I like that they have to measure it. And it's like, he's forcing them to, quantitatively think about it so where am i on this scale and then afterwards have i moved a little bit I, I i like it when we can measure things i guess that's a skeptic in me so i want to ask questions you guys you got mick west right here so so i i have a, a all-in woo friend who i've actually stopped talking to on facebook because it hurts me with her police structure. Uh, it's, it's personally harmful to her and everything. But one of the things is another category of 9-11 of truther that she talked about that I'm wondering if you've heard before. She said that she met online a woman who said she was in an experimental team creating a free energy device in the basement of one of the towers of the World Trade Center and the experiment mm -hmm. went wrong. <laughs> well, that's a new one. I haven't heard that. It's is interesting that because uh, it is new, but it, the obvious uh, issue with that is that there were two towers. And so why did this free energy device in the basement of one tower cause both towers to collapse? And, and the same Explain. woman, the same, my friend also. One you know, was a control me. and one was the actual. So there yeah. were two different machines and two different towers next to each but other. At a different time, my friend Christine had argued about that the planes and she had some you know, blurry video of, of one of one of the towers being hit by one of the planes, mm -hmm. and you could see these giant tanks on the outside. It's like, what? So, so she's yeah. not saying there weren't planes that did this. So you're telling me they did an experiment that went wrong at the same time they flew planes into the building that were automatically controlled with external bombs. It, it made no sense. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I think like you, with a person like that uh, whose ideas are so fragmentary and disconnected and aren't really based in reality, it's 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 very difficult to get anywhere. And you know, like you said you, you don't talk to her anymore. It's probably because like she's so resistant uh, to well, reason. Well, it, it was a personal reason. She also uh, her father mm -hmm. died of a horrible lung drawn out cancer, and she was promoting the idea that medical science killed him because they have the cure and wouldn't give it to him. And no right. matter what I said about how ridiculous the scope of that conspiracy has to be to be true, her friends and her attacked me. So that was kind of a struggle. Easier to attack than actually listen to yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I Unfortunately, there are some people who the amount of effort required uh, to get them out of the rabbit hole is, is great. And the amount of time required, mm -hmm. maybe even greater. Uh, I think most people can be helped. When most people like this seem intractable, but uh, I've certainly she, she's more like the, um, the, 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 the uh, his name is escaping me now. Now the, the lead guy at the head of the modern flat Earth movement revival. Oh, Mark uh, Sargent. Mark Sargent. Mm. I, I, she, she's not quite the head of a movement, but she's got she's mm. she's a professional. So and, uh, okay, she's got thousands of followers. She's bought she's, into it. She can't. Oh, yeah. it you can't back out of it right now. To back yeah. out of this. Her specialness and her maybe even her yep. income. What yeah, other questions uh, do we have for Mick, you guys? None. Well, we, they're they're being very quiet over here. 
And we've so, answered all of them. So it's not Everyone, quite a question, but it's an interesting comment. I talked to you about this, Susan. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a local fringe meeting. And the topic was... The, fringe, uh, like in your hair? Or is it like a knitting community where they have... They make fringe it? science, they call it. Oh, uh, oh fringe, that fr kind of fringe. Fringe, and then the name of the not state. Not like your hair know. fringe. No, no. It, it, you know, it's, I've been to these meetings and people there generally believe anything anyone says that's out there without questioning it. And if you challenge it, you're the wrong one. Uh, but but the, the topic was the coronavirus is coming true and it was predicted in the past. And the leader of the presentation was his, his, his mode of presenting this was showing sci-fi movies from the last, I would say, all the way back to the 50s. And he had a Venn diagram of them overlapping, Animal Farm and uh, 1984 and Soylent Green. And he was taking bits and pieces from each one saying, see, they foresaw this and that's part of the proof. And then one of the people, of course, and Bill Gates, like it was somehow- George Soros too, yeah, must be in there. Unbelievable. The, yeah, if there's Gates a Venn diagram, it must be science. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, was, scary to, it was scary to watch. And I, I didn't say I wonder anything. if you could, uh, with, with that situation, if you could do something where you essentially do the same thing, uh, but, but do something else that was predicted, like something com completely innocuous that, that has happened, like, I don't know, the Teletubbies or something like that, or something more, more up to date. Than They're in on it. The Teletubbies are in on it. I tell you, uh, that one, that purple one, you can't trust him. He's got shifty eye, eyes. <laughs> I, I, essentially like uh, some kind of like you know logical fallacy. I'm not sure which one it would be, like Texas sharpshooter or something like that. Confirmation bias, essentially, uh, where they just they're just cherry picking loads and loads of things to to make a case. And you know you can do that with like Nostradamus about any anything. You can find some Nostradamus thing that fits uh, any particular event. Uh, and in some ways, like it would be good if people put in the effort to do these things, but they're very, very hard to do. Like one of the conspiracies that comes up all the time is the Clinton body count uh, yeah, conspiracy. Yeah, I, I, that's amazing. You would think people list. would know. You think they would know, but the problem is there's only a list for the Clinton body count. You know, no one's put the effort into making a list for the, the Trump body count. Or oh, the, it was on, uh, the, it was on the front know, page of the New York Times Ailes. the other night. A yeah, thousand names. It's it's uh, -dum -bum. Sorry. it's because the the conspiracists put so much effort into things, and people who are not conspiracists they think it's ridiculous, so they don't put the effort into doing the exact same research in the the other direction. And right right now, if you would try to make the list of a Clinton body count for somebody uh, who's like just some kind of Republican uh, person, it, it would probably be quite hard because they've they've spent years creating this Clinton body count thing just like you know probably the people who are making these presentations have spent years connecting dots uh between various uh, esoteric things in, in history so there's uh, kind of know, an imbalance do you know george george hansen george p hansen he wrote the book the trickster and the paranormal no uh, so he's an author and he's part of this uh, this fringe organization and, and i i've been at a presentation of his this was a couple of years ago uh, it was January, I guess it was January 2019. And his thing was, it was all about the, the, the UFO um, NASA videos, or I think Navy videos we were talking about before, yeah. the, tic the Tic Tac videos. And his, mm -hmm. his whole presentation was a connect the dots to prove everyone in, who's famous, who knows anyone, who know, all know about this conspiracy to hide the correct thing about the US government covering up aliens. And it was about to come out. And that's the reason that this UFO video, because it was a part of a slow release to get us used to it. And then he had gone back in. There are also portals that can transport us to Mars instantaneously. Oh, like that's Stargate. awesome. Stargate. And so he was going through all the science fiction movies. And then they started talking about the secret space program that also has you know, special so rocketry. Secret. <laughs> no, it was on, and, I, and I'm actually an aerospace engineer, so I actually outed myself, and I said, you know, I, I've worked on spacecraft design, and I know people who worked all the way back to Apollo, and we didn't have any access to alien technology, and it was just trial and error and slow improvements, and then they whispered, he's a spy, and it was like, that was the last day I was ever to talk in that meeting, Aww. because they just wouldn't listen to me, but it was like, the, the ability of those people in that room to connect dots that should not be connected, and just think it's a fact was astounding. Well, isn't that how our brains are, are wired, if you want to use that word, is that we connect dots. That's why our society survived to some extent. We so I'm try to Mick, find patterns. Bit, yeah, any, any testing on that sort of a thing where people are more susceptible to pareidolia that by these conspiracy type thinking and thoughts? 
Yeah, that would be interesting. That is uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was the was the attribution error, where mm -hmm. people tend to attribute. Oh, is that to, that? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's attributing things to an actual external course, but it isn't really the, the same pattern matching thing. I think there is research into that. I have a little list on my wall of uh, of similar things. But yeah, it's like finding finding patterns obviously is going to uh, yeah. work very well if you're a conspiracy theorist because it's it's a paranoia type thing. Oh, it was amazing. So so they had a he had a a PowerPoint presentation, and it was it was to prove that everyone in the government and even Hollywood people for some reason who know each other all knew about this alien UFO reptilian thing. And it's, it, you mentioned the Clintons, Hillary Clinton went on the tonight show and the tonight shows executive producer is this person and, and his brother-in-law works for the CIA. And it was like, Oh my God. It was like pretty much, I was there with, with several other skeptics and we're texting each other. You know, I, I, this is astounding. I can't believe the people are all nodding about this, but they were mm -hmm. all buying it hook, line and sinker. Yeah, there's there's, uh, there's a, a variety of weird subcultures in the conspiracy movement, and one of them is the belief that uh, crisis actors are behind uh, shootings. And there's within that, there's a really extreme subculture where they think it's the same crisis actors being used over and over again. That's and crazy. within that, there's right. an even more extreme one where they think that these crisis actors are actually celebrities. Mm. And so there's this oh. one guy who thinks that one of the guys who... Uh, whose son died in Sandy Hook, uh, Robbie Parker, is actually Tony Hawk. And oh, I think I remember you hear, hearing you mention that. I thought, yeah, what are you talking they, about? They put pictures up of this guy and they put a picture of Tony Hawk and they look kind of similar. And they've got literally hundreds of these types of pairs of things like, uh, you know, Joe Rogan is actually, uh, I don't know who, who he is, like some... Uh, I think I mean, it's like Alex Jones is uh, that comedian who died like be before that. But it's, all these people are the same person. Mm -hmm. and it's Up Denver? Completely <laughs> ludicrous. It's completely ludicrous, but they, they, they glom onto the smallest thing, the smallest connection between these, these two people. And they say, oh, well, it's the same guy. He's just had a nose job and uh, has fake ears and fake teeth and stuff. But you can tell it's the same guy. Uh, but I think okay. it's almost like once they start thinking that is possible, then anything becomes possible. I had somebody at work approach me thing. Yeah. about five years after Challenger, so this would have been early 90s, mm -hmm. that telling me, you know, those, those astronauts didn't die, they're still alive, they're yeah, in a witness yeah. protection program. And then he started sending me uh, URLs of okay. photographs of, of like Krista McAuliffe next to somebody else named Krista something else. Oh yeah, they wouldn't change her first name because, you know, and she looks somewhat yeah. similar and it's like, I was astounded. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that you, you get them uh, uh, anytime, like there's, there's a, a meme of the, the crying lady, uh, which is from all these. Oh, yeah. Celestia started talking about that. Very, it's very strange that very upset. Woman, when people are crying, they, they tend to look yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. Facial expressionists and some women have long brown hair. And so you put them next to each other and usually they use a low resolution photograph that's mm -hmm. fairly blurry and it looks like the same person and they mm -hmm. people genuinely believe that this is evidence that everything is being staged and that you know, everything in the media is a lie and uh, i think you know that type of thing is, is very difficult to address uh on a larger scale but you, you can still address the individual claims you can show that they are actually different people mm -hmm. by using higher resolution photographs right and i've done that with some people in great detail put up this uh these videos of two people who are supposedly the same person talking and they're obviously different people. And yet some people still can't see it. They still can't see that these two people who are obviously different people are not the same person. And I think there might be a certain degree of, of face blindness going on there. You know, and this is, which is a real thing. Some people mm -hmm. do have a kind of a face blindness where their brain can't process faces and recognize them in the same way other people do. So you might be getting a weird set of conspiracy theorists who, who all have face blindness and have all bought into this idea that there are all these different actors um, you know, playing parts that are uh, corrupting the, uh, the narrative in the media. It's kind of a fascinating little, little subculture slash medical mystery type thing. Paula has a, uh, wants to enter, enter her, she's raising her hand. One of the things <laughs> that uh, she had, uh, I was thinking of is that at the same lecture that um, Mick had given at Skepticamp, which I hope you guys all come to someday when we're able to have live mm -hmm. 
camps again she talked about hollywood conspiracy theories and i don't oh, know if that's yeah. what she's going to talk about that also, that also came from a youtube algorithm where i was watching flat earth stuff and it started showing me other conspiracy videos and it just wow conspiracy you can't believe um the question i had for for mick is uh one of the biggest conspiracy theories that's going to really affect us currently is uh, the anti-vax conspiracy because we're going to have a vaccine eventually mm -hmm. for COVID-19, but a lot of people are saying they won't take it. And are you seeing a difference between people on the left leaning politically and the right leaning politically on why they won't take this vaccine? And if you've come up with any interesting things about that? Yeah, I, I, I think this is kind of a long-standing division in the people on the left uh, are more kind of concerned about health and well-being and the well-being of community. It's kind of a generalization, obviously, like it, it doesn't mean that people on the right are not, but this is kind of the way people tend to uh, kind of lump themselves. If people are concerned about community, they're more kind of left wing. If people are concerned about individual freedoms, they're more right, right wing. Mm -hmm. So the people who are concerned about uh, individual freedoms don't like vaccines in part because it's being forced on them by the government and the people who are on the left uh, don't like vaccines because they think that it's bad for everyone's health. Uh, so there's that, that division, but I think it's a very broad way of looking at things and the, each individual is going to have different, uh, different ways of looking at it. And with, with vaccines, the thing is there's so much writing out there about vaccines and it's like homeopathy. There's so many articles on homeopathy explaining why homeopathy is nonsense. And there's so many articles explaining how vaccines work and there's YouTube videos explaining why vaccines work and all the sciences, herd immunity, that, that type of thing. The challenge isn't really you know, me explaining it to people. The challenge is getting people to look at these, these other sources. And I think where, where possible, you want to try to, like I said earlier, try to uh, use sources that are in their, their sphere. So if there are, if they are left-wing people, then perhaps you know more left-wing media outlet source would be more appropriate. And if they are more right-wing people, then you know hopefully Fox News has done some articles on uh, on how, how vaccines actually work, and you can find those and, and link to those. But yeah, kind of tailor which source you use to the the politics of the individual. Mm -hmm. We had a person on Facebook the other day saying, or yesterday even, um, saying that um, if he was on Skeptical Inquirer and we were talking about vaccines and he said, you know, if people, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I have friends that are and they really just need to be seen, shown the science and, mm -hmm. and they've had to go and sue the government to get the information and if only they would show the science and, and that's the whole problem is they're not explaining it. And I responded to the guy, I said, I don't think that these people really want to see the science because the science is out there. It's just they don't want to look at it. And, and I said, and if it wasn't this, they would they would give another reason. I said, at a certain point, you have to give up and just, you know, you're not listening to what I'm saying. The, <laughs> I mean, yeah, just look like, around you at polio. Where is polio these days, right? You know, how many iron lungs have you seen uh, lately? You know, so just, they just don't want to have that conversation. They don't want to look at that evidence. It doesn't matter. You can't hand them a link. They won't trust it even if they did. Yeah, but hopefully you can find something that uh, will move them a little bit closer to reality. Because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are, you know, everyone everyone can be moved to some degree, like most people, unless they are the kind of the more extreme cases that we've discussed here. But the vast majority of people and the vast majority of our friends uh, are actually open to to uh, correction, essentially. And this is this is something that people talk about in the skeptic community is the idea that there's a backfire effect where if you explain to someone why they're wrong then they become more convinced that they are right uh, but you know more recent research has kind of shown that the backfire effect isn't quite as big a right. factor as people thought it was and if you do the explanations well uh, then you can avoid the, back the backfire effect uh, so people do respond to new information and it might not seem like they're responding straight away, but if you if you you you, you got to figure out how to best get it across to that individual, what are they actually going to respond to in the long long run? And maybe not don't start with something that tells them that their entire worldview is false. Start with something I don't know, like the history of vaccines or something like that, or a little little documentary on how smallpox was eradicated, mm -hmm. or you know, one of those one of those things. Be, be I, finding I, something I in common with them. 
I botched it with a friend of my wife. She had over, uh, invited her over for dinner. Shame on you, Rob. I did. It was a year ago. My wife was in the kitchen doing something and I was keeping her company at the table. And she said something about having trouble finding our house. Her GPS wasn't working. Maybe the volume wasn't loud enough. And I thought I misunderstood her. I said, volume? She goes, yeah, like to communicate with the satellites, you know, I have to turn the volume up. So I then- <laughs> Look at Adrian's little... face. <laughs> So huh? li literally, that's what I would be telling the same. By the way, this is a school that teacher. She's a school teacher, though music, but still. So she turns out knows nothing about you know satellites. Well, like you don't have to know about satellites. It's just kind of anything. So, but anyway, the point is, in five minutes, I basically explained how GPS works. And oh she my god! Totally accepted it. No, it was fine because she didn't have a, a, a you know a, a dog in the fight. She didn't. She thank you for explaining that to me. Oh, I see. But then, the, like two minutes later, my wife brought out her strawberries and they were organic and not GMO. And then I had it like, oh, what's wrong with GMO? <laughs> Rob, oh, it Rob, was like I had pick said, your, your, battles, your mother is dude. a prostitute. To, so yeah. that pick was your the battles. end of that conversation. Like, yeah. you know, she launched into me. You're probably trying to protect the scientific establishment, was trying to poison us all. Wow. And so, so the difference was she didn't care about it really how satellites and GPS work. She was anxious to learn, but this was part of her belief structure. And I stepped into her mind. So, yeah. so I, I want to just, cause we're getting long and I, I, you guys are seem to be enjoying this as I am, but I want to talk really quickly about what happened last night or three o'clock this morning, because you, mm. you guys will be first to know and it's conspiracy related. So uh, the reason why my name is Joanne Nilsson right now is we put together a sting of a psychic in um, New Zealand. And um, so it was put together at the last minute uh, using the same kind of, we, I don't think she was a hot reader. I really didn't think she would do that. I thought she would do some cold reading. So we threw together some pages really quickly. It was a 10 person um, situation, 10 seats. And so I was talking to some people from New Zealand because once we did the math, it was going to happen at one in the morning, California time. So I couldn't involve anybody in the United States because you guys all would be asleep and, and uh, California was probably the, the best, you know, at one to three in the morning. So um, I, I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll use one of my, my Facebook pages, which is Joanna Nilsson, who sometime today will have a new name because um, this is probably going to go bigger. So I don't want people to find Joanna Nilsson and realize she's a fake page. So she's going to have her name changed. Sorry, guys. But anyway, um, so we were able to buy two seats. Uh, I got one and one of the New Zealand skeptic board members got a, a ticket. And so eight other people were in the room that were not part of the skeptic community. But what was beautiful was is that the guy who bought the ticket, his mother was coming to visit him and she's the sweetest, sweetest thing. And so I said, would she be the person on the call? And she did it. She sat there. She goes, she was nervous. And, and we did a little pre-interview and everything. I said, you just agree to everything the guy says? Because she was totally blinded. She didn't know what was on her fake Facebook page. And so she had a fake name and everything like that. So it was a lot of fun. So here comes one o'clock in the morning and we start recording. And oh my gosh. It was meditation. It was it was music of you know. Mm, do you feel like they're holding your hand now? And it was just oh my gosh. I'm I I mean I stay up late, but I usually only stay up late if it's something really I'm doing some kind of interesting thing. But by two in the morning, I was just watching this person meditate, and we were in a Facebook live group, which is a <laughs> private group. And so the name on my um, Joanna Nilsson, I had to change it because I knew that when we started a Zoom part, she said we were going to Zoom and I thought we were going to do readings, readings. I didn't want her to see Susan Gerbic because obviously you're going to, you could Google Susan Gerbic and, and um, this is a psychic we've written her Wikipedia page. And when she found out that she had a Wikipedia page, she went ballistic. So uh, she was writing to, uh, to Wikipedia with a conspiracy that blah, blah, blah this con giant conspiracy. And she blanked it several times. Yeah, she was trying to blank stuff out, and she was really getting in, into the big deal. Um, the the this is a woman who believes in anti anti vax, anti five G. She pushes a supplement called HFI, 
And um, so anyway, on her Wikipedia page, in the comments of the back page, she was posting, I am not anti-vax. I am not doing this. I'm, she was selling something called purple rice. And anyway, uh, so it's a multi-level marketing thing too. So um, to make a long story short, she, she, we finally get into a Zoom room. And all this two hours plus, I've been, you know, we've all been quiet. We kind of post in the, the chat of the Facebook group. And so she wasn't going to do Q&A. She wasn't going to do anything, really. She, she's just like, oh, did everybody get something out of this? Anybody have any? She kind of said, you know, anybody have any questions? And somebody asked a question. And I'm thinking, oh, it's almost, it's like 3.15 in the morning. But I am damned it if she's going to leave without something that I can get. And, and what I, my goal was is I wanted to see if I could get on video her talking about being anti-vax so that we'd have at least something. And sure enough, she, 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 I raised my hand and she's like, oh, Joanne. And I said, you know, that we have a, I'm here in America and we have a pandemic going on. There's a hundred thousand people dead and, um, you know, it's very frightening and something about a vaccine. Do you foresee something happening? That's a vaccine coming along. And she went on for like four minutes. Rob has Rob has heard this because I just post. It got posted in a group where he, you you heard this last five minutes. She went on for like five minutes talking about the conspiracy theory of uh, COVID and that it's just going to go away and that she never would have supported Trump in the past, but now she thinks he's the most brilliant man. <laughs> oh my God! She was saying he's so smart. He's ending mandatory vaccinations, and she's not anti-vax at all, but she believes, what was, how did she turn, Rob, you, you heard it. In, turn what? She went from, I'm not anti-vax, but. No, the part I was talking about was she was saying that COVID wasn't really killing people or, or a lot of people or something like that, and you pushed back. I was surprised because you were undercover. You said, no, I know people who have died all around me and and then she, and then like within five minutes after going on to some other stuff then she was talking about oh yeah the virus is mutating and it it doesn't want to die and die out and it, it was like it has an intention and it's purposely mutating yeah. and then it's going to mutate out of existence by the end of the year she said yeah i, I really pushed her on that too because i said yeah. you think this is going to be she says there will not be a vaccine the thing's just going to go away and she says i said so I was trying to get her on a date and she I said something about 18 months. She goes, it won't be 18 months. It's going to be sooner. And I'm like, she said by the end of the year, yeah. she swear. She, she says it will be by the end of the year. This will be gone. And then she was, I kept pushing her back on her. And, you know, like I said, I was a little punchy because it was three in the morning and, and I already listened to two and a half hours of her meditating. So I was, I, and I did say something. I did say, Cause she was saying that she was bringing up like it started like it was going to go into the illuminati there's power behind yeah this. you asked you asked do you mean the jews and, and she she dodged that one yeah. <laughs> it was, i'm thinking to myself i should edit that out but then i thought no i can't edit anything out because if because i want to release it to the media in new zealand because this woman is obviously uh uh putting out false things about vaccines and new zealanders are not putting up with that shit so i'm thinking i'm going to go and give it to the news organizations and i thought i should take that jewish part out but then i thought i can't because then they'll say what what's missing yeah. well you're clearly trying to bait her so. do you think i do you think it came out clear because i haven't heard the audio yet but it did she sounded like she's going into that path and i thought oh should i mention well she was being like uh, unclear uh, obfuscatory about like who it was and and maybe she was thrown off because you asked her directly. I don't know. But then, yeah, she wouldn't say yes to that. <laughs> that was a bridge too far. But oh oh, but that was it. Three hundred people was that, the, or was it thirty people? Control what? all the the money in the world. Yeah, something like right? that. It was three oh or three hundred? Um, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, but she did order you order get the bank, impression she like, really believed yeah. this? Oh yeah yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't know. She could be just a great actress, and I don't know where that story would come from. But And I don't know what the reason was even to mention it to you if she doesn't believe it. It's very weird. Yeah. I, oh, and I, it's all going to come clear. So, but this is like, uh, if, if these yeah. things come true, I might believe in psychics, or at least her. Because this was very specific. This will, the virus that's why will be I kept, gone. That's why I kept questioning her. I wanted it on record. I wanted it specific oh, yeah. on record. That's on the record. Yeah. 
Yeah. She We're going to know about this year. global conspiracy to control by the end of the year. world's economy by a very few people. It'll all be by clear. The end of the year. By yeah. the end of the year, the virus is going to go away. Just go away. And Trump oh. is a brilliant man. I missed that part. She says, I never would have thought. Yeah, I think because she went on and she kept going on, you know, like she'd start and then she'd just keep remembering something and kept going on. So I think that might have been, she paused and then she brought, she says, I never would have thought I would have supported Trump. I never in a million years would I have thought that I would have anything to do with this man. But, but I think have he's the, the most those, brilliant those man. Those two concrete predictions on something maybe you can, if you get it published or you can write about it so you can use it, about the tiny number page. of people who control the whole entire global economy and it will come out by the end of this year at the same time that the coronavirus will be gone. And, and the really nice thing is, is that I can quote her exactly yeah. because it is all woo out there. I don't have to, Im I don't have to lean into it or give any kind of... Yeah slight uh, my opinion on anything I can say here it is and I'm hoping that we can get it on the audio of uh, what I'm thinking I'm going to do and and I haven't like I said I, I got off of one call to the next call to the next call I have barely combed my hair so um they I want to take the think what I'm gonna do is reach out to the reporter who we used a lot of the research from to write the Wikipedia page because I know she's she's a New Zealand reporter and I think what I'm gonna do is to say here is this, we have this. Um, you are free to do whatever you want with this, this clip that's clearly not been touched. It's just from here to here. And I think I'm gonna say, but you have like a day, heads up, because we're gonna release it to other media in, in New Zealand as well. But because you had done a lot of uh, work on this topic. And then I think what I'm going to do is I'll release the audio to uh, Skeptic Zone and other podcasts and let them play the audio from. Oh, I love it. Because I think that it, it it's. Break, breaking it's news. I mean, that could be, you know, that, that could be the hook. Breaking news. COVID to be gone by the end of the year without a vaccine. And the world conspiracy to control the global economy will be revealed by and December. And Trump is brilliant. <laughs> What's her name? Jeanette Wilson. J e a n e t t e. You can find her on Wikipedia because uh, we wrote the Wikipedia page. She tried to get into the UK uh, to do a tour because she's actually British, and uh, uh, the New Zealand skeptics let the uh, Good Thinking Society, Michael Marshall, know that she was going to do a tour over there. And Michael Marshall, uh, I guess, wrote to all the places she was playing and having a venue and said this woman is anti-vax blah 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 and they all in turn canceled all her speaking gigs so she wasn't able to go to the uk and do a tour so uh she hates michael marshall and she hates all the um uh, the good thinking society and so when she found out she had a wikipedia page and you can look on the talk page i think it's on the talk page so if you look at her wikipedia page there's a little button in the corner that says talk i think if you click on that you can see her conversation where she's just really just losing it trying to trying to say i am not anti-vax god looks out after everybody and god is the actual person who's healing and she's a healer too by the way oh 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 this I, I gotta say for my own video, this is the most amazing thing. And let me see if I can pull it up really quick. Let me, let me think of, I, I, wait, wait, you guys are gonna love this. No, this. She does psychic surgery and it's not the old kind where, you know, you fake. I thought she was laying on hands and that's what uh, right. no, Linda over here is like an expert Spiritual on. help, she, she's channeling actual surgeons from the afterlife who that's just has powers to help the people. She yeah, asks the surgeon. A new form of psychic surgery. That's unusual. That's, yeah, it's really that's, great. Ha that's healing touch. It, no. Yeah, well, she psychic was touching him. Psychic surgery. Psychic surgery. Okay, wait, wait. You guys. It's an offshoot of therapeutic touch. Mm -hmm. Of which, You're an expert uh, in therapeutic on. touch, no one touches anybody, by the way. Uh, sometimes they do, but uh, mix, mix the right. healing touch was a offshoot of therapeutic touch and then they just they put out an ad uh tell us what you would like to add to therapeutic touch to uh to make it work for us to define healing actual touch. touching so it's, it's just <laughs> massive weird stuff my Linda's gonna have to do it linda's gonna have to do a talk on this because she's her manager it who uh, very inappropriately basically tried to force her office staff to be her test subjects, therapeutic touch. This was like 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, she was doing a paper on it. 
Yeah. So that's when I first learned about it. Oh, darn it. I can't. Oh, gee. Shimmy Crickimus. Crickimus. Oh, uh, everything is moving so slowly because I've got this internet thing going in here. Hold on a second. I'll rough for you. So I've, I've personally had experience with, with, a, with a Reiki master, and I didn't know it. We were at a, uh, this is in the days before social distancing, there were 20 of us at a table, and I had just met the young woman, and she held my hand asking me about my, some issue that we were talking about. And it was actually a little uncomfortable, like she wasn't letting go of my hand, and why is she doing this? <laughs> my wife is next to me, her husband's next to her, so it clearly wasn't a come on. Okay, I don't know your personality. She was very bubbly, and when she came, she was hugging people she didn't know. Okay, you're a little unusual. But then I find out that Reiki is done by holding like your palms. And so you know, later on, I found out, since she said she was a Reiki master, that she had done some unauthorized medical treatment on me, and I think I should sue her for medical malpractice, because I didn't sign anything. <laughs> You didn't say, okay, so, so, so this is, I can't wait for Kenny Biddle to see this. Let me, let me screen share this to you. So during the talk and, and this is early on somewhere, she starts talking about how she's got pictures of people from the other side. And this I'm going to show you is a picture of her, her. The other side of the ocean? No, this is her, this is her parents. From so let's see side. if you can see this. Can you see that? This is her parents. This is her dad. Oh. And this is her mother. Is that Does anyone there? else see anything? I don't see a photo. I see a, yeah. a brown rectangle. Yeah, me too. You can't see the orb right there? Yeah, oh, no. those two. Those right are right here. There's oh. dad. Oh, okay. And there's mom. Oh. They look like orbs, right like out, out of focus motes of light. Of oh, some sort. right. So I don't know why that as people from the other side. Well, that that's mom and dad, and he only they only appear on um, her son's birthday, oh. and um, so on her son's birthday she pulled up she she pulled out a camera, and um, took more orbs that apparently they only interlink like that. Mm. Uh, where you get them, and this is some friend of hers. This is a friend in spirit that has been visiting her. Can you see her friend in spirit there? Sure. Uh, it looks like a screen. looks like a fiber, actually. You see that? Yeah, like dust or something like that. Let me. It's something. Obviously, it's just uh, you know something in front of the camera. But... Oh, I think it's one of those paranormal rod things. Those rods. That <laughs> it could be. It could be a lot of things. But like I said, I was really tired. I'm in screen sharing. But the friend I, I was talking all about, about by the way, is big into this too. She goes to graveyards and places where people have been executed in penitentiaries, which are closed now. And she's got all those photos on her site about you know, ghosts. I, I it cr cracks me up. Okay, so anyway, we need to end this because we've been very patient with with mixed time, and I really appreciate it. So, um, when I put the post up on uh, this video up on YouTube, I will put links to some of the things that Mick is heavily involved in, like Metabunk um, and some of the other things that you do. Remind me if I miss something, and as well, uh, you guys really need to check out this book if you haven't already got it. Well, please post that last video where Mick put together all of his, uh, the TikTok Empire. UFO stories once. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah the TikTok, uh, not the TikTok, the CNN. I keep thinking of, the, of it as a CNN thing because it's how you yeah. responded to CNN. The, the Navy, Navy UFO videos is what they generally refer to as. Okay. I'm making myself a note because um, I have another Zoom call after this soon. And um, is there anything else that you wanted to say, Mick, before we go? Uh, no, I think we pretty much covered it here. My, my, <laughs> we my, could have talked for when, hours. When people I ask me that, uh, my, my usual retort is, uh, my usual response is to say, like, people need to keep a genuinely open mind. But I think everyone here is a skeptical person. Right. So just, just keep an open mind. But, yeah, encourage people to look at both sides mm -hmm. of the argument. Linda has a quick question. I have a quick question. You mentioned the backfire effect. And we have a bill here in Colorado, which kind of, uh, it's supposed to be a, a pro-vaccine bill. It's going to require people who want a belief exemption to take online education. Mm. But there's been, uh, and the pro-people are really pushing this, even though there's research that shows several types of online education I have a backfire effect and then there's the Oregon. Uh, Oregon has this same thing and after five years their belief exemptions is slightly yeah. higher than before. 
they started the online exam? Yeah, yeah that's so definitely a problem. Because uh, if people are forced into doing something, then that really, I think, mm -hmm. you know, the resistance to it from the start. Like when I, I take traffic school every time I get a speeding ticket every few years, and uh, How often? I, I, I have to do, <laughs> uh, I have to do these courses online where they, they try to teach me about uh, you know traffic safety and whatnot. But it's in one ear and out of the other because it's just this thing has been imposed upon me. Mm -hmm. So I can certainly see that that being an issue uh, might not be the best way to go about it. I don't know. Are you getting, getting kilometers and miles mixed up from back when you used to use drive that, over on the other side of the uh, ocean? <laughs> I, think I it's occasionally get through a speed trap. Our, our governor here is somewhat anti-vax, and mm. he said he won't sign a bill unless it includes the online education. So it's gotten really political and a real right. mess. It's fascinating here. Yeah. Well, hopefully we all vote how it will work. Out. Because people are not putting up with this anti-vax stuff. I'm, I really do think that people are like, oh no, we're going to vaccinate <laughs> and you're not coming into my store without a mask on, you know, at least that's how I it is in America. The problem is a lot of pro-vaccine organizations in the state aren't standing up to him. Right. And anti-vax is very organized. They have got some slick stuff and talking points and they just, it's like the, what is it? The Gish Maybe. Gallup. They just yep. tell you everything and you can't can't react fast enough unless you're an expert on this kind of thing but anyway so we're gonna sign off i've had a lot of fun i have learned yeah. a lot thank, thank, thank you. you so much mick i thank really you, appreciate it your questions thank you guys you, were really great thank and you, thank you, you so much for the back background with the cats because i've been enjoying all the cats walking around the room mm -hmm. linda's had cats walking a gray cat walking behind her Adrian, do you have a cat back there too? It's hard to tell if that's a purse or a cat that's sleeping. Dog. It's a dog. A dog. Oh, there's a dog. <laughs> I didn't know we had dogs in our committee. And we and Hamilton has, has been uh, sharing the role of uh, of uh, my co co uh, whatever it is that I have here on this. <laughs> co what is it? He's my so admin. He's an about time cat. About time, get one of my about time cats, and and of course uh, Carl with his famous cats that have been sitting there and, and and enjoying the talk. I hope they learned quite a bit from us. I'm sure they did. All right, so thank you guys. Um, thank you. Look for this later, right. and Thanks, uh, encourage other people to watch the video. And I think this has been a okay. great talk. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye, everyone.